Good evening. This open meeting of the Newberry Conservation Commission is being conducted remotely consistent with Governor Baker's executive order of March 12, 2020, due to the current state of emergency in the Commonwealth due to the outbreak of the COVID-19 virus. In order to mitigate the transmission of the COVID-19 virus, we have been advised and directed by the Commonwealth to suspend public gatherings, and as such, the Governor's order suspends the requirement of the open meeting law to have all meetings at a publicly accessible physical location. Further, all members of public bodies are allowed and encouraged to participate remotely. The order, which you can find posted with agenda materials for this meeting, allows public bodies to meet entirely remotely so long as reasonable public access is afforded so that the public can follow along with the deliberations of the meeting. Ensuring public access does not ensure public participation unless such participation is required by law. This meeting will feature public comments. For this meeting, the Newberry Conservation Commission is convening by Zoom, as posted on the town's website, identifying how the public may join. Uh, please note that this meeting uh, is being recorded and that some attendees are participating by video conference. Accordingly, please be aware that other folks may be able to see you and that you should take care not to screen share your computer. Anything that you broadcast may be captured by the recording. Uh, all of the materials for this meeting, except any executive session materials, are available on the Town of Newberry's website under agendas. We recommend the members and the public follow the agenda as posted, unless I, the chair, know otherwise. Uh, we are now turning to the first item on the agenda. Before we do so, permit me to cover some ground rules for effective and clear conduct of our business and to ensure accurate meeting notes. I, the chair, will introduce each speaker on the agenda. After they conclude their remarks, the chair will go down the line of members inviting each by name to provide any comment, question, or motion. Please hold until your name is called. Further, please remember to mute your phone or computer when you're not speaking. Please remember to speak clearly and in a way that helps generate accurate minutes. For any response, please wait until the chair yields the floor to you and state your name before speaking. If members wish to engage with each other, please do, do so through the chair. Uh, uh, after members have spoken, the chair will afford public comments as follows. The chair will first ask members of the public who wish to speak to identify their name and address. Once the chair has a list of all public commentators, uh, they'll be called on uh, and afforded three minutes for each comment. Uh, finally, each vote taken in this meeting will be conducted by roll call vote. Great. Anybody show up while we're talking? No, they didn't. We're still waiting on one more, right. at least. Well, we've got Dan, we've got Pete. That's all we really need, right? You already threw Bill out, so. <laughs> yeah, unfortunately, Bill just doesn't count the way you used to. Um, <laughs> Good evening. Uh, so, what are we doing? So, I think you have to we wait. Haven't had this right. Yeah, we have to wait. We, we have, have the whole lower. <clears throat> we need one more committee member. I'll reach out to uh, Ben. Oh, there's Thanks. Bill Lord. There's Bill. Dave's a good. Now we have a quorum. All right. As soon as he can connect. So that we I'll know connect. he's going to be. Listening. I'll connect his phone if necessary. Yeah. Exactly. Thank you. Bill Lord, if you need to use your cell phone for sound, I have your number. I'll let you in. Hmm. 
Ben should be here shortly. Thank you, Peter. Thank you. Bill Lord, can you hear? Yes, I can. Uh, yeah. Excellent. Success. Brilliant. Just tilt it's your screen deal. a little. You're cutting off half your head. Thank you. There you go. All right. With that being said, let's get rolling. We've got our quorum. Uh, so Harry's waiting. Starting and, uh, we have a special meeting. Uh, special. What's this? The next regularly scheduled meeting date is April 20th of 2021. We do not have any minutes to review tonight. Um, starting at the top of the public hearings, we have a wetland bylaw amendment update. I think um, because we've got so many people waiting, we can leave that for the end. Uh, it's a short enough topic that I don't think we're gonna lose anything. Um, so uh, going to the commissioners, if anybody would uh, like to do that now, as opposed to just getting through the, the business items. Uh, Mary is Good. coming in and Ben is here. All right. I was so uh, starting with Cassandra Gallapio. I Gallipo. hope I didn't butcher that. Gallapo. Gallapo, thank you. Um, at 25 Northern Avenue, DEP number 050-1345 an NOI to perform repairs and additions to an existing single family dwelling. All right. Um, Bill Holt, you wanna fill us in? Um, I can, I was gonna, usually we'd like to have the applicant do the presentation if they have one. Um, there's an app, is there uh, applicants from yes, here? Yes, they are. The applicants the representative is here. This is John Dick. All right. I'm an independent wetland consultant. Used to work right. for Hancock. And I'm sort of retired now. The uh, the Gallipos occupy the house at 25 Northern Boulevard. They propose to put a roof over their rear deck and to add a uh, an addition on top of the existing roof. There is no increase in the impervious footprint. There is no increase in the uh, overall footprint or the foundation footprint of the dwelling. We are in an interesting situation here. Uh, this house is three ranks, actually four ranks in from the primary dune, but the primary dune over the course of time has moved landward and now engulfed one of the houses out on the, uh, out on the beach. FEMA uh, has recently revised their rate maps to indicate the velocity zone extending all the way to the landward toe of the primary dune. And that puts the velocity zone diagonally through the house on this site. That is based on the presumption that when the, when the big storm comes and you have a velocity zone event, the dune disappears. And that's where the wave velocity ends at the toe of the dune or where the dune used to be. Behind that is land subject to coastal storm flowage. Uh, that's at elevation, uh, elevation 13. And that basically extends underneath the house and around the existing foundation. We propose no change to the existing foundation, which is partial. It doesn't extend under the deck. Uh, what we are doing uh, the only thing that really seems to be of acute regulatory interest is we are putting a roof over an existing deck and that increases to some small degree the impervious footprint because the deck is presumed to be partially pervious. Uh, in compensation for that, we're proposing uh, re recharge trenches along the drip line. There will be no surface discharge uh, by a pipe or a downspout we're going to let the water fall from the eaves and put a stone trench along both eave lines to, uh, to mitigate for that flow. This is not a requirement for a single family dwelling, but it is 
in consideration of the fact that we're sitting on a couple of wetland resource areas. Uh, that pretty much concludes my presentation. I can answer questions if you've got any. Okay, great, thank you. Um, so Bill, do you wanna lead us off? Yeah, so essentially I uh, agree with the presentation. Um, there is a, it's primarily an upwards addition to the existing home. Uh, there's no increase in the overall footprint or building cover, it remains the same. And there's no structural changes that extend down to the ground and there's no impact to do uh, in terms of uh, excavating or foundations or anything like that. There's uh, no change in the current property line offsets. They remain the same. Uh, the addition does increase the FAR, the Florida area ratio from 18.6 to 26.2, which is slightly over the allowable 25%. So they will need to go to up and obtain a ZBA approval for that. Um, when they apply for the building permit, they will know that if they don't already. <laughs> um, say the area is mostly in the flood zone as, as they indicated, but they're not doing any grading changes. Um, so I, those are the only comments I have. I don't really uh, have any other comments other than they should show where the uh, dumpster for any debris is going to be uh, store, uh, placed and a staging area for materials, um, which we can uh, stipulate in the order of conditions if we choose to. Um, I did take, go out and take a look um, at the site. It's pretty much, uh, I have a lot of vegetation on it. Other than on the left hand, left hand side of the house, there's a little bit of vegetation between the house and the uh, fence and the abutting, abutting house. Um, but for the most part, the yard is fairly gravelly and, and uh, it's like a parking area. So there's not a lot of um, vegetated area at the site. Other than that, I have no other comments, and uh, I'll let the commission have their shot at comments. Okay, thanks, Bill. Uh, let's go around the horn. Uh, Benjamin, you, you lead. Nothing at this time, thanks. Okay. Uh, Bill? No, I don't have More? any added comments. Okay. Can you hear me? Uh, Jenny? You sure can. I, I don't really see much going on here. The question of the V zone <clears throat> is, um, I don't think, given there's no changes whatsoever with the interaction with the ground, I don't really see it as being anything that's worried about. Okay. Um, Mary, is Mary here? Yep, I'm here. Um, Bill, did you say this requires ZBA? Uh, for the floor area ratio. Oh, you're muted. So, yeah, they do exceed the 25% uh, allowable uh, FAR, so they will have to go to ZBA for that purpose. Okay, so is that has that been applied for already? That I don't know. I can ask the applicant. It uh, has not. Okay. That, that that was my one question, and then also just if there is uh, if there's vegetation that is um, potentially damaged by putting up scaffolding or, or whatever they need to do on the exterior, that we get some pre and, and um, pre development photos, and they replace whatever um, dune grass or <clears throat> native vegetation uh, upon completion. Um, okay, Mary, um, that sounds good. Are you, you're, is it all right if I move on to Peter? Yep, I'm all set, thank you. Okay, um, Peter. No other additional comments than what's been mentioned. Thank you. Um, and I will uh, say the same, it sounds like between uh, Mary and Bill, you know, my points that I would have brought up have been covered. So, um, Bill Holt. Let's go to you and uh, do you want to just write up an, uh, an order with those details in there? Um, I probably should ask if there's any butters first or any butter comments. Yeah, you're right. I'm in a rush. Um, 
Uh, anybody here to speak on this one? Going once, going twice. Anybody waving their hands frantically in the air? I'm not seeing it. They are not. Uh, all right. So, all right. So we don't have any public comment. Uh, no. Back to that. Yeah, one public comment. Sorry, I couldn't shut Where? my mute fast enough. Oh, okay. Go ahead. Sorry. So Rebecca Stanitsi, uh, uh, Five Eight Street, which is to the um, south of this this parcel. Um, so our primary concern is the FAR that's being proposed here, and that's not really your purview. So um, I appreciate that you raised that, and we'll be commenting later. Um, but there is a concern. The site is so small. You can see that the existing gravel roadway, um, 8th Street in, in lovely Palm Island parlance, you can see where actual 8th Street is and where it should be. <laughs> it's very different. Um, so it's a very tiny site. Um, so we would just be concerned about, um, again, how you construct something like this, even if it were approved um, by zoning. So that would be the, the large concern. So not just, you know, I appreciate documenting the plantings. That's great. Um, but the question is, how could it even be uh, constructed to something a uh, concern of the neighborhood? Okay, thank you. Um, you know, to that point, uh, you're right, that's not really our purview, but part of um, Bill Holt's uh, job would be sort of finding the places and putting them down on uh, paper uh, where various uh, materials would be staged. So it's not entirely, you know, of uh, disinterest, if you will. Uh, but uh, that's something that Bill, um, yeah, going back to that point, do you want to run this uh, as a, do you want to write up the OTC that way, or do you want to uh, discuss and come back with something with a finished product? Uh, and we can go over the various you know, site plans, you know, and Mary, you know, do you have an, uh, an opinion on that particular question? I think the question is just whether or not you should hold off on the decision until the ZBA makes a decision or if we want to act first, it, it, it doesn't matter to me, but um, I know under under the state rules, you're supposed to have applied for, you don't have to obtain, but you're supposed to have applied for all local permits that are um, required at the time you file. Correct. Yeah. Hello. Yeah. Oh, they're waving your hand. Oop. Oh, yeah. there we go. Yeah. Okay. There we go. Possible go ahead, guys. Is it possible to shrink the addition by just a couple of feet to get it to the 0.25? Because that was our original attempt is to comply by all regulations. We thought that's what, that's why we hired Hancock Associates to um, help yeah, us with Keep this. us in those parameters. So we weren't asking for any special favors um, as far as the constraints on the- uh, We were under the impression that we were at code. It's only like a 200 and it's only a bedroom. <laughs> I don't know, what's the square footage? Yeah, we could easily shrink it down just by the few feet needed to make it above 0.25. We, we just have a lot of kids and we were trying to get a mommy daddy bedroom away from the children, you know? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but anyways. Um. You could revise well, the plan and come back on, and we could be prepared to issue an order at the next meeting if you think you won't need the zoning board. It's, it's up to you. I mean, either either you have to apply for the variance that you need or revise your plan. Um, and we would need to have that in order to act. I wish we knew that because we waited four or five months to do all of this work. <laughs> we were hoping that, you know, if we had approval, we would be able to start building before it became busy beach season. You know what I'm saying? I mean, it just makes, yeah. when you think about it, Northern Boulevard, it's a busy road and um, we vacation there and rented different properties and that's just a busy road in the summer. So um, we just figured it wouldn't take much to have that construction done because it's just the, um, my husband's a builder and he puts it up fast. <laughs> I'm a Massachusetts licensed contractor. So, um, with a, yes, yeah, so it's- But I mean, I'm just work. saying that, you know, I just, I didn't know if there was any, we thought this was all done with Hancock and- And I'm assuming the zoning is another, you know, 30 to 40 days out if we applied to zoning, which we'd rather not do. 
Uh, yeah, our next meeting is April 20th, so. Yeah. yeah. Um, the provisions that we all share yeah. on the size? I'm sorry, I couldn't hear that. Is it on, could we do like a, maybe an approval based upon plans coming in with just the wall moved over, you know, the whatever we need, the six, eight inches per foot to bring the square footage down? It, it, you know, the, the thing that's on my mind right now is that, you know, there's, there's just enough um, conversation about tweaking and, you know, color and changing things around the edges and not really addressing the core that we really should have plans that reflect the final piece of work. You know, and I don't think you're hearing any concerns from us other than uh, the plans need to be, you know, what the plan is as opposed to, you know, something that, you know, we might come back and sort of change a little bit later. Um, and so I think maybe the thing to do is, you know, we'll just leave it open uh, and let you guys figure out if any changes are going to happen and if there's any other uh, conversations you need to have. And when you've got everything um, taken care of, you know, I don't think it, um, you know, I don't think you're going to hear anything from us that needs to change, but um, maybe we should just keep it open as a matter of formality so that we don't end up changing the plans too much and then having to reopen something because what was approved by somebody else looks too different from what we've got. Okay. Um, okay. Going to the board, does anybody want to um, add to that or say anything to that point? Yeah, I kind of wonder if uh, if the representatives for the Galpos have, you so oftentimes will have a little matrix on the plan that just goes through all the square footages and so on and so forth. I think that might, you know, be helpful if the... Uh, Representatives reviewed that as well. Good thought, Dan. This, this is the representative. If you go over to the lower left corner. Yeah, it's right there. There's the table right there. And yes, it is. It's 27.43 square feet. So I don't know. I don't know what that signifies in, uh, I'm sorry, 27.43%. Okay. And I don't know what that signifies in square feet. Uh, I don't do architectural yeah, review on a wetland scientist. That, but, that actually uh, wasn't the issue. Oops, sorry. We can sit down and work this out with the builder and the uh, and the building inspector and come back to you. And the, the 27. The other issue that you mentioned was storage of materials and a dumpster. And I did describe that in the narrative. That's all going to be in the existing parking area yeah. behind the building. Uh, it can't block the right of way, even though the right of way isn't within the right of way. Uh, so basically, that's described, but we can certainly add right. a note to the plan saying, here's where the dumpster goes, here's where the trucks park. Yeah, I was just going to condition that. That's, that's not a problem with conditioning in the in the uh, order conditions. And the uh, right. the ratio is, is not the uh, lot coverage. The lot coverage, you exceed 20%, but that's staying the same. It's not changing. It was actually the floor area ratio, which is a maximum of 25, which they're tweaking at the 26.23. So that's slightly over, so you'd have to go to ZBA for that. But if you do reduce that down to 25 or less, then you wouldn't have to go to ZBA. That change technically would not likely be one of our real big concern of ours because it's less than what you're proposing now. So if you do knock it down and not have to go to ZBA, it really isn't a concern for the, the commission um, as long as you don't tweak, you know, change anything else on the plan, as far as the cover uh, of the structure itself on the on the on the property, so uh, I, I'm not I'm not having a headache over the 26 percent going down to 25 if 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 the commission wanted to. So, uh, Is there right, so. <laughs> Brian? Do you think there's some way to do a creative digital age Doug Packer here? I mean, in theory, yes. In execution, I really don't know. My thought about execution would be that if we do not continue or close the this hearing right now and bump it down to the end to talk to reapproach it, is if they could resubmit plans where they knock off a foot of that, you know, a foot in the length of that bedroom that brings it down to 25%. And by the time the meeting closes, we could look at the new plans and then 
approve those. Is that acceptable to the rest of the commission or not? How are they going to get it uploaded into the meeting? By hmm. um, can we ask one question? I, yes. So the addition was designed at 273 square feet. So it spared like a foot and a half off of what was allowed. That's why it was specifically designed like this is to be at 273 square feet. We purposely designed it that way. Just to fit, just to fit in the criteria that we knew about. It's two, seven, 273. So I don't know how it's that much of an overage. Yeah, are you suggesting that perhaps the, the FAR on this plan is incorrect? That, that the calculate FAR on this plan might be incorrect? That's what I'm suggesting, yes. Yes. Because that was our whole goal with working with them is to keep it under 273 so we fit right in the parameters under by just a little bit so there wouldn't be any questions. That's why we're kind of a little confused right now. Do, do you have anything you can, or your, or does uh, Mr. Dick have anything he can share screen with to show that that there that that, that that this number that showed on the plan is incorrect? If you can, I mean, I'm I'm fine personally. Is if you can show me the math and it actually comes out to 25 percent, and that this is simply a typo on the lower left hand corner of this plan. I, I I think that then I don't have a problem with it. But if if the if it is over the FAR and it is twenty six point two three, then it's still a problem. I don't think there's enough information on the plan to be able to do that because you need mm -hmm. to have the floor plan to calculate that, and I, I don't see the floor plan here. There uh, there was a floor plan. There is a set of architectural plans filed with the notice of intent, they aren't Hancock plans. And I don't, I, I'm not cap capable or competent to tell you whether one plan agrees with the other or not. Uh, we can we can take a look at them and see if we can come back with a convincing story later on. I'd be happy to do that, but I'm, uh, I'm not sure I've got enough information either. All right, well then um, maybe we can start with Ben's idea uh, of just sort of you know, coming back at the end and seeing if there's anything and um, we can, anything new to talk about. And then Dale, I see you, don't worry. Um, how's that sound? Uh, any commission members wanna comment on that idea? Or again? <clears throat> Going twice. Okay, in that case, um, Dale, what's on your mind? I think he's I'm muted. good with tag. Yep. I'm good with tabling it. I'm coming back to it. Okay, thanks, Bill. Um, uh, Dale, are you muted? It's on his phone. Oh, what number are you? Do we know? Are you six zero three nine six six? No. No, that's uh, nine seven eight six zero nine. 8714. All right. Uh, Bill or Kathy, can you unmute that? I'm trying to. 9786098714. Is that correct? Yeah. yeah. He doesn't show as muted right now. There he does. 6098714. Yeah. I, I keep asking to unmute. What is it, star nine? Have you tried that, Mr. Bowden? Star six. Star six. Star six. See if I was wrong. There you go. Hello? You're in. Uh, technology, perfect. Thanks for helping me figure that out. So um, my name is Dale Bowden and I live at 23 Northern Boulevard. I just have two questions. One is, does, so does adding um, 
a roof over the porch, does that not add to the uh, FAR? That's uh, Phil Hall, you want to take that one? I, a, I don't believe it does. That's a question from the building inspector, though. I'd have to ask him to be sure. Okay, very good. Yeah, that would be important for us to understand because that would add, uh, how many square feet would that add to the uh, to the house? I have to check. I don't know what the square footage of the deck is. But it would add a significant amount, I imagine. Which would then take them into the FAR, again, over, being over the FAR. Approximately 360 square feet. Thank you. So is that, is that something you want to try to determine now, or I, I just, I think we probably need to get an answer to that. Yeah, that's outside of our jurisdiction, basically, right? I mean, whether or not the roof, that's a building inspector thing. I mean, if we're not, I don't know, Bill, how does that interplay work in terms of um, it's, it's what we more to do with, more to do. Yeah, it's more to do with the FAR. So again, if it, if it's, if it does increase the FAR, then they would be likely going back to the, the ZBA again. We already uh, spoke to the building inspector three times. And the building inspector has said he had no problem with it. Did he not? Mm -hmm. My husband's spoken to him numerous times. I don't know. So the, the other question I have um, is so the, the, their property or their the house is 58 inches from my property line. So is there a forum to discuss the setback limitations for an addition like this? I did talk to Peter about uh, that. And as long as it does not go closer to the lot line, the addition, the upward addition, then it's not increasing the nonconformity. That's, that was his interpretation of the, of the current zoning bylaws in, in Newberry. Okay. And, and what are the requirements about accessing the site during construction um, wh wh where there's such a limited space? Wh what are the considerations there? Um, I'm not familiar with any potential restrictions other than they have to stay on the side of the property line, but uh, as long as they can put a ladder up or be able to work on the building. Uh, I assume that there are methods of doing that, but I, I'm not familiar with construction techniques uh, in limited space. Gotcha. So the, so the FAR, that would be, that's, that's a zoning issue then and whether or not the roof over the porch adds to the FAR? Yes. Okay. Great, thank you. Can you just right. provide your name, full name? You, I think you said your name, but not your address. Is there an address at the start, just so we stay formal? Yeah, 20, 23 Northern Boulevard. Thank you. You got it. <clears throat> All right, so just checking anybody else uh, from the public. Going once, going twice. No, okay. So then uh, let's go to the commission. Let's have a, I suppose, do we need a vote to see this again at the end of the meeting or can we just sort of see them again and do the voting later? Um, ben, do you remember, or Dan, do you remember how we would do this? Because we're not choosing to do an action and end it in the meeting. So, you know, we don't need to see them next meeting. They're open. We can just keep them open and uh, they can let's come back. Let's go ahead and right? play it safe and vote. I'll move to table this till the end of tonight's hearing. Second, second that. Uh, okay, excellent. Roll call. Uh, Benjamin. Yes. Bill Lord. Yes. Daniel. Yes. Mary. Yes. And Peter. Yes. And I'll also vote in the affirmative. Um, all right. So here's hoping we're not here till midnight. And, and yeah, if the Gallipos can figure out all of this stuff between now and then that would certainly help us make decisions. Perfect. All right, thanks. We'll see you guys um, shortly or not shortly. We'll find out. Thank you. We hope to be um, back fairly soon. All right, moving on. We have 
Uh, Sherry Melton at five, Plumbus Downs, an RDA to construct a stairway access by adding a landing and steps to an existing deck. All right, uh, Ms. Nortel and our representatives. Uh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna try to uh, talk you, explain the situation with for Mr. Mrs. Meltel. She is present, but um, she asked me if I could uh, explain what she's proposing to do. Um, let me uh, share my screen, and I'll try to walk it through you. Oh, yeah. Can you all see my screen right now? Yep. All right. So this is a GI uh, aerial view of the of the property, and this is her existing house. This is number five. This is number four under construction, which is obviously an older photo because it's well underway in the construction now. It's uh, all framed in. Um, this is her parking area. There's a, a, a LP tank here, and I believe that's the sewer pump right there at that location. And then proposed stairs are going to be added right in this location. This is her deck. Right now, the only access she has to the house is through the front stairs and the front door, which is located here. She does have a uh, door going on to the deck naturally in the back, but there's no no steps coming down off the off the deck to be able to exit the rear of the house should it be an emergency in the front of the house. <laughs> so by building code, you're supposed to have two ways, one way in, two ways in and out of the house. Um, she has a way out, but no way to get down off the deck if she needed to. Um, currently, she uses a ladder either on either side, sent it down and climbs down the ladder to, get to the to the ground level and walk out to the, out to the car or to the street. So what she'd like to do is have these steps added on to the, to the house. Um, what I have is the architectural plans, which show where the steps are located. And there's the front of the house steps going up into the front house and decks in the back. So you'll see these steps coming down off to a landing and then down to the front. Um, that's the front elevation is the back elevation with the deck in the back is a door out of the house right now. Steps will come down and go out. Uh, they're proposing to use a diamond pier to pin the, found, pin the uh, supports to the ground. There'll be four of them. There'll be two, uh, four for the uh, landing and then the steps will go down. So the steps will come down off the, uh, three or four steps off the uh, deck level to a landing turn and down to the front and is the, the LP tank is located right there as well. Um, this steps will be right between the two, the tank and the, the sewer pump, uh, which is why they had to come out with the, um, if you notice they came out a few feet and then down have the stairs end up between the two uh, the tank and the two tanks. So here's a top view of it again. The four posts would be here um, to, to support the landing and a couple steps down to the ground. So it's pretty minimal impact to the resource area. There's the four uh, posts. And then it, land, it comes down to where the, uh, the steps are come down to where the you're outside the marsh, outside the resource area, uh, at the back of the driveway, and uh, basically leads you to the car. So that's that's the proposal. It's not a significant impact. The um, the height of the deck is about five and a half feet to the uh, deck level, and take a half foot off for the uh, supports. So they have about a five foot separation there, and the three steps down and the three steps down from the pad, put it right in the middle. So it's about two and a half feet up um, from ground to the lower support of the pad, um, the landing pad. So I think it's a fairly minimal uh, impact with a fairly necessary <laughs> set of stairs that she kind of needs to be able to get down off the deck um, should she need to and not be able to go to the front. So I'll, I'll open up any questions if you have any and uh, try, to, try to help her answer them. <laughs> Bill, where's the marsh edge? The marsh edge is just about, right about the middle of the steps. It's uh, elevation, I think it's elevation 6.1 6 is, is considered and it's right right there is, is where that elevation is. So it's it's over the, the marsh. The deck is in the marsh? 
Yeah, the deck is in the mash for sure. I, I, I am sure of it because <laughs> the elevation, this um, elevation floor is over through here, mm -hmm. four or five, and then it comes back around and then wraps around. Actually, the mash might be a little bit further out. It might be in the middle of the deck, so this might be just outside of it. It's very but close. Are the, the deck stairs in the marsh? No, the deck stairs, I'm sorry, the deck stairs will not be. The middle of the deck is the mouse. Okay. Yeah. These will just be outside. Um, they will be impact, you know, on the ground surface of the four uh, diamond piers, but relatively minimal. All right. Well, thanks, Bill. I think, Mary, you probably got to the heart of what we're all thinking, but let's double check. Um, ben, any questions? Um, more just that, Bill, did you not, um, share any of these or did I just not get the email for five corn bush downs? I thought I sent them out to everybody. Should have. Did I, not I, I don't you? think I got it. I just searched all my email. But anyways, um, regardless of that, I'm, I'm not completely up to speed on this one, but, uh, yeah, I, I think I'm going to sit back and let see what the other commission members have to say for the moment. So I'm not up to speed. Okay. Um, well, for what it's worth, Ben, I got the email. I don't know. Maybe you're just not popular anymore. Maybe it's, no. <laughs> I apologize um, if I didn't get you. Hey, hey, Anything on your mind? What was that? I'm sorry. No, I was asking Bill Lord if he had any anything to say. Oh. No, I think that it's minimum impact and it's a safety issue. I don't know how we let somebody let them build a deck without a way of getting off the deck in the first place. So I think we need to correct that. Okay, thanks, Bill. Uh, Daniel? I, I, it looks to me like the area where this uh, these stairs are gonna go has been pretty well disturbed with additions of sewer pumps and stuff like that. So I don't see a problem. Okay. Uh, Mary? Just out of habit, anything beyond what you know you said before? I'm sorry, my, my uh, uh, connection just died. Are you talking to me? Oh, yeah. I was just seeing if there was anything else on your mind other than okay. uh, the boundary for the marsh. Yeah, no, it, it seems pretty straightforward. I just is it, Do we have any information on when the deck was constructed or if there was a permit ever issued for the deck? I, I do not. It, okay. I think it was at least 30 years ago. Yep. Okay. Seriously. Well, then you're due for some stairs. Mm. <laughs> I am. Um, going down the ladder is not fun. <laughs> I don't have any comments. Okay. Thanks, Mary. Um, Peter? No, I think it's a safety issue that needs to occur. All right. Uh, I don't have anything else to add. Um, that being said, I think it sounds like uh, we'd be uh, ready for a motion on this one because, yeah, I don't think there's anything that anybody brought up that we need to cover. Okay. Uh, unless there's a public commission, I suppose. Dan, what did um, you just say? Sorry. I think Dan just first did it. But Dan, you got to, what are we, we're doing a negative three? I, I don't know about the, the three, but I don't really see any, uh, maybe you guys have some conditions, but I don't really have any. The only condition I would have would be the pre-construction meeting with the contractor just to kind of go over the uh, process. I don't see any need for a dumpster in this particular case. So uh, I'm not worried about where that's placed and it's a very limited construction, probably won't take more than a day or two at best to finish, so. Um, so yeah, what kind of what kind of uh, negative determination are we making? I'm presuming the three, but. Negative three, yes, negative Thanks. three. Um, all right, so then, uh, Dan, you still first thing on your negative three, who's gonna second them? Second. I'll second. Them Thank you. Uh, we'll give. Mary, we're going to give Bill credit for this one just because Perfect. he never gets a, a phone that works. Um, <laughs> um, all right, so we have a first and second. Roll call. Benjamin? Yes. 
Bill Lord. Yes. Daniel. Yes. Mary. Yes. And Peter. Yes. And I'm also a yes. All right. Ms. Meltel, you're all set. Bill, I presume you'll help her out with uh, the rest of it. Yep. Thank you very much. Excellent. Sure thing. And enjoy your stairs. <laughs> I will. Um, <laughs> All right, here we go. Next thing on our docket, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service DEP number TBD, uh, an NOI for salt marsh restoration between third parking lot and maintenance building west of Refuge Road, Newberry, and a request to waive local filing fee for the project. All right, who's here for Fish and Wildlife? Nancy Powell. Oh, there you are. Excellent. All right, well, why don't you introduce us to what's going on? Let me, uh, you gotta give her the screen. Your, make sure you can share your screen. Hold on a second. <laughs> I think I, oh, no. <laughs> I gotta find you. Yeah, so I'm sure while Bill does that, um, you guys have gotten a big, big package from us. Um, there is a yeah, NOI package that's like 44 pages, and that is mostly because of questions that CZM and DEP and Army Corps had uh, in a pre-application meeting we had. And um, I also sent Bill a condensed version that's about four pages, just the basics. So you guys can have both versions, whatever you wanna read. Um, and I do have a short presentation Oh, I got it. Should be able to now. Yep. So let me see if that works. Can you guys see this? Yeah. Okay. I'm actually. All right. I'm gonna start down here first and then go back up to the. Oh, maybe not. Okay. I'll just. I'll show the map at the end. Um, so we are doing. I'm calling the hundred acre marsh restoration. Um, as um, Brian mentioned, it's between the third parking lot and down to sub headquarters. And this is basically a culmination of six years of all the pilot techniques that's been tested on the refuge um, in partnership with a lot of folks. Greg Moore had presented previously on one of the techniques. Um, We've been going a little bit slow on the refuge and um, doing everything kind of one uh, technique at a time and making sure that we really understood everything. And now we feel like we're ready to do a holistic um, whole marsh hydrology restoration. And so this will be our first attempt to do that. Um, we also know this area really well because this is where we tested all of our techniques. So we've been walking this, these sites for you know over six years trying to understand what's happening. So I'm gonna just very briefly talk about some of the techniques that uh, we did. Um, I guess I'll just mention that, you know, I think for, for many years, most of us um, thought that the marsh was pristine and we didn't need to do anything. I certainly thought that when I got to the refuge and with climate change and with the ditching, we realized that that is not always the case. Um, so I'm gonna, you know, so one of the most obvious ones is all the ditches that were dug in the marsh. And initially we were worried about the marsh being drained too much with all the ditches. Um, one thing that we're kind of learning now is that with increased sea level rise and increased flooding and the ditches not being maintained since the 1970s, these, a lot of these ditches are actually clogging or have been clogging on their own. And as they clog, they form these wetter areas. So the darker green you see is kind of a patent marsh that's converting to uh, alternate floral marsh, so the wetter marsh. And as they clog, pools will also start forming. Um, so, you know, we have these large pools that's forming in the middle of the marsh. And eventually, you know, in some areas, the pools will drain on their own, and we are seeing that in some areas. Unfortunately, with sea level rise, in a lot of areas that's not happening. We're seeing these entire marsh areas converting to open water. 
Um, we also know from some work that's been done by grad students and some of the work, earlier work on the refuge that when you have a lot of high density dishing, the elevation of the mulch is actually about 20 to 25 centimeters lower where you have high density uh, ditches. So one of the uh, two, actually, let me skip back. So one of the other things that we've realized as we are trying to figure out what's going on in the marsh is that there's actually been work by the early settlers in the marsh that we didn't really understand. Um, in addition to the ditches, they've actually built a really extensive berm system in the marsh. So the farmers, the salt marsh hares were actually building berms in the marsh and basically turning the marshes into fields. And in some areas, they were actually changing the hydrology enough that they were planting Timothy hay and even forage beads um, on the upland edges. And these dikes, so this is a painting from Acadia, but this, the uh, publication you see from um, the 1820s was from an area in New Jersey um, of how to do this. Today, these berms look like these. They don't look like much, but they actually still do whole water. And with sea level rise, you know, this is one of the things that's converting more of these areas to open water. Um, so the two early techniques that we piloted were ditch remediation and runnels. And I'm not gonna talk too much about runnels since you guys have already heard about it. But the idea of ditch remediation is to cut the hay and roll it into the ditch and the idea is that the hay traps the sediment and over time, as you can see in the panel on the left, the pea builds from the bottom up and the vegetation comes in and we are basically healing the marsh or getting rid of the ditch. So we're reducing the density of the ditches. Um, this is a before and after runnel. Um, but again, like I said, I won't talk too much about this because I think you guys have already heard about this. Um, some of the other techniques that the refuge looked at early on. So um, one of the, in the 80s, 70s, 80s, and 90s, um, there was a lot of mosquito control work done to try to um, do mosquito control. One of the things that was done was to create these berms in the marsh and plugs to hold water onto the marsh. And as you can see from this aerial photo, it does make the marsh pretty wet. Um, so, you know, the ditch plug on your left and then what I'm calling an on one plug on the right that's holding all that water. We piloted using basically the runnel technique for both of these two um, more recent infrastructures. And you can see from the aerial photo on the right how much drier the marsh is after restoration. And here's some before and after photos. So on the left is a ditch plug um, restoration that we did and you can see you know, the plug was creating these open water. And then after we reconnected the ditch through the plug, you can see the vegetation coming back and this is gaining a lot of elevation. So the marsh can build elevation if you can restore the hydrology. Um, and on the right is an armworm area where the water was held in the marsh. So a lot of the areas were converting to mudflats. And again, after we kind of dig the little channels, um, pretty shallow, about 30 centimeters, the, the vegetation. So that's within um, a couple months, um, the vegetation comes back. Um, so with the ditch plug removal project in the same area that we're doing the work, one of the first things we did was to decide to take out these ditch plugs that we knew was something that we had put in earlier. And this is Jeff Wilson doing the work. Um, and you can see this is a channel he digs um, afterwards. Um, here's another example. So this is right before the salt pans. You can see the mud flats before we did the restoration and then after we did the restoration. Um, one of the things we're learning is that with these runnels, we are actually also kind of changing the hydrology of some of the pools. So this is the big salt pans site on the refuge. It's a big birding area. And before restoration, um, some of the birders were kind of, uh, you know, letting us know that the shorebirds had disappeared. And I think it's because the pond was getting deeper and deeper because of all that water. But after restoration, the, the, 
the pool actually, um, a portion of it becomes mudflat during that, the week of Eptai, um, so that we get shorebird habitat back. Um, one of the other techniques that we piloted was with the sediment that we're removing from the runnels, um, we decided to try to build kind of higher elevation mounts, uh, mostly for saltmarsh sparrow, but also to try to understand, you know, how to do gain elevation in a marsh. So this is a quick example. On the left is right after we finished construction. And then in the middle is um, three months later, that same summer, and then um, the following uh, year. And what's impressive with the, this project is that within two years, we're basically getting really thick thatch, which is something that the saltmarsh sparrows um, look for when they're nesting. Um, so as I said, for this project, it's putting it all together. Um, in, the, in both documents, um, it's also in the shorter document, I try to describe how we've kind of designed the restoration um, this was something that both DEP and CZM asked for, like, you know, how did you design it? How do you know you're doing it right? So I try to explain a little bit of that. Um, I will say that the design process took us about 18 months. Um, and I had um, kind of the experts that helped develop this technique help us, so Jeff Wilson, Susan Adamovich, um, David Burdick from UNH. Um, these are the guys that kind of have been working all along to figure out these techniques. And, you know, they, they helped me walk the site multiple times and they verified all the designs um, at the end when we, when we got to the end. So I can take questions. Um, we have submitted the permits to Army Corps, DEP, Mass Wildlife. Um, we're doing endangered species consultation with the state and with the feds. We're doing tribal consultation. We're doing archeological consultation. Um, so a lot of permits are out there. I just wanted to present in front of you guys um, because the NOI will be issued through the town and um, address any questions or concerns you guys might have. Okay, thank you. That was kind of fun. I enjoyed the the picture of the Acadians. Those were that was a tall ditch, um, or not a tall ditch. Sorry, um, the exact opposite. Um, <laughs> but um, uh, I, you know, for myself, I don't have any questions. I am intrigued when you guys show up and bring these things to the table. It's kind of fun and interesting. But let's go around the horn. Uh, Benjamin, anything on your mind? No, thank you, Nancy. Really interesting stuff. Um, a lot there to absorb. I, I was sitting down with it the other night. Uh, really interesting. Uh, I'm going to keep on looking at it, seeing as, as I think it's, everything will get continued, but I appreciate you putting it in front of us in the presentation tonight and all the good work you're doing on the refuge. Thank you. All right, Bill Lord. Um, thank you for the presentation. I don't have any, few, any more questions. I think it was very well presented. All right, uh, Daniel. Yeah, I think uh, the last time we uh, came, you know, there was a project in front of us. Um, you know, I was kind of expressed that there was all these different techniques that I've seen over the years, and it was really helpful to read your narrative for this project because it seems to include all the other things you've done and make it more makes it more understandable for me. Thank you. Okay, uh, Mary. Uh, yeah, I think this is really, really important work and I'm, I'm really happy to see the refugees working on this. And I think we, we definitely wanna support them in these efforts. And um, the commission may remember that I, uh, the trustees of reservations um, submitted a notice of intent for part of Old Town Hill Reservation where one of these techniques was used. And um, there's now, you will be seeing another notice of intent for additional areas on the, um, Fish and Wildlife property or uh, additional um, area near Kent Island where all three of these techniques that Nancy was talking about are going to be used as well. Um, and I, 
I don't think it's a conflict for me. Um, I'm working with some of the same players, but different different projects. So I think that um, just had a couple of questions for Nancy on the permitting. And was this filed as a regular notice of intent or did you file it as an um, ecological restoration notice of intent? It's an ecological restoration notice. OK, good. Yeah, and because of the issue with the water quality certificate, whether or not that was going to be required. OK. Um, that's helpful. And I see there's no DEP number yet. So I guess we have to keep it open for, for that. And I know that a lot of the comments at, um, on the projects that I've been working on had to do with monitoring and how what monitoring protocols there are. And I, I'd like to take a look at what is being proposed. I'm sure they're very similar to what's been proposed for other projects um, nearby. So I think that it's going to be really critical to keep an eye on how these projects are working. So we know what works, what doesn't, um, and how quickly we can scale up these um, techniques to include other areas because it's really a fight against time right now with the marsh subsiding and sea level rising uh, to try to preserve these marshes as best we can. Yeah, so there, there is a monitoring plan for this project. And I think I've just captured a small portion of the monitoring because, you know, as you know, Mary, the, the partnership and I think the refuge, because we've been piloting all these projects all along, we are monitoring a much larger um, mm -hmm. set of projects. Like we're still monitoring the, the first one I did in 2015, we're doing a subset mm -hmm. of that. So, and we are coordinating um, with um, UNH that just got a large NRCS grant to do large scale uh, monitoring as well. So we're using the same protocols. Um, you know, we're working with trustees and Mass Wildlife and now Mass Audubon and Greenbelt um, to make sure that we're all monitoring the same thing and that all the data we get, you know, gets uh, synthesized, um, as you said, so that we can learn as quickly as possible, because we do feel that time pressure, but we also understand from a regulatory standpoint that the scale of restoration is a little bit like uh, new and maybe <laughs> alarming. Um, so we want yeah. to assure people that, you know, these techniques are not going to cause unintended harm down the line, that we're really thinking about the marsh process and how the marsh is responding to climate change and that all techniques are designed to work with how the marsh will respond to climate change. Right. Yeah, I think we've learned a lot since the original mosquito control projects. Yeah. Okay, uh, thank you, Mary and Peter. Nancy, appreciate the presentation, all the efforts of doing this and bringing us back to the classroom. It's always good to get re-educated. Thank you. All right, great. Well then, uh, yeah, as was mentioned, we still need a DP number so we can't do anything tonight, but uh, I certainly didn't hear anything that we need to worry about and come back to. Um, so, uh, let's uh, let's go to the public or Ben you're waving at me again. You want to keep talking? Yeah, sorry. I forgot one thing in my comment where um, one thing we could talk about tonight is it looks like they've request, uh, put in a request to waive the local filing fee, which I personally would support. All right. Um, well, can we separate that? I don't know. I suppose we can tell her verbally that we support her request <laughs> tonight at least. All right, good enough. So then, uh, let's do a let's do a vote on uh, the filing fee, and whether or not we can finish it, we can at least uh, have that you know sorted out. Um, all right. So I think Ben just first did that. Anybody want to second it? Second. I have Bill David. I have Roll Call. Uh, the eyes being in favor of no filing fee, waiving the filing fee, and um, you know the opposite saying you know please pay. Um, all right, so Benjamin. Yeah. All right. Uh, Bill Lord. Yes. Daniel. Yes. Mary. Yes. And Peter. Yes. And we'll also agree with everybody else. All right, good. So whether or not we can uh, formally agree to not do that, at least you know where we stand on the issue. Um, so then that being said, I think the next item of business is to just, you know, kick this can down the road until we get a DEP number. Um, 
Bill Hull and Nancy both. Uh, do you think we need to pick a date or you know, like, do we have a sense of when DEP is going to give a number or do you just want to sort of wait and see? And then we'll, I mean, can we kick it past what is it? The 20th is the next meeting or will DEP be slower than that? I don't know. What's the sense that you guys have? Um, I guess I'm, I like to continue to next month and I will get in touch. So D, we just, I did send the check into DEP um, and they needed that to issue a file number. Um, and, um, and I'm assuming that before you guys can issue the permit, you need to hear back from DEP and who needs to hear back from CZM and Mass Wildlife. Though nobody else really, I don't think anybody has concerns. It's just the process. Um, and then the Army Corps is separate. Um, that's a separate permitting process than the NOI, but the, the NOI is wrapped in all the state consultation. Um, so I will, like before the April meeting, I'll start contacting everyone in the state and see where they are and let Bill know. And if they are getting ready to issue a determination, hopefully we can get it before the next, your next meeting so that you guys have the answers from all the state agencies before you issue your determination. All right, that's good enough for me. Um, so let's uh, continue this to the 20th and we'll find out um, if anything happens, you know, hopefully in time to determine, make a determination. Anyway, all right, so uh, who's gonna give me a first? Like price is right rule. Come on. I make a motion to continue the meeting to April 20th. I'll second. All right. Thank you. Roll call. Benjamin. Yes. Bill Lord. Yes. Daniel. Mary. Yes. Dan, did you vote? Yes. Okay. Uh, and Peter. Yes. Now I'll also vote the affirmative. All right, great. Well, good luck, Nancy, you know, getting through all this. All right, what do we have coming up next? Um, where's my next? We have Zenco LLC, 15 Coleman Road. Ah, let's, I'm going to open up three of these at the same time. Or, yeah, let's open up all three so we can talk about them if we need to. Zenco LLC, 15 <coughs> Coleman Road, DEP number 050-1348 is an NOI to construct for an eight lot open space residential development project that includes a 400 foot roadway, six new single family homes and renovation of existing single family home with associated stormwater management utility access paths and limited grading work within the 100 foot buffer for the proposed drainage and roadway. Uh, DEP number 050-1347 is an NOI to construct for a single family home on lot four, which includes utilities, driveway, limited grading work within the 100 foot buffer. And DEP number 050-1346 is an NOI to construct for a single family home on lot five, which includes utilities, driveway, limited grading work within the 100 foot buffer. All right. So with all those being open, um, who is here for Zenco? I am Tom Z. Uh, thank, thank you, uh, thank you, Brian. Uh, I'm just going to spend a couple of minutes uh, uh, in summary here. But uh, first of all, my name is Tom Zarico, uh, 15 SD Street in Amesbury. Um, this is a follow-up uh, to what was originally uh, uh, proposed, if you recall, a month or so ago, as an RDA. It's the same work that we that we discussed uh, in that application. Uh, uh, but this is the, the preferred, the preferred method of, uh, of filing for this, uh, for this amount of work. So, um, in summary, the site uh, consists of approximately 32 acres fronting on Coleman road. It's bisected by a wetland, which has an existing farm road crossing. Um, the proposed work here is an eight lot open space residential development. Uh, with one lot being the existing uh, house and barn, um, one lot being the large uh, open space lot, which represents 86% of the site, about 27 out of the 32 acres, uh, and six new uh, newly constructed homes. 
The 400 foot roadway proposed to service this uh, with utilities and stormwater facilities is entirely outside of the uh, uh, jurisdictional areas. The jurisdictional elements uh, include a small portion of the stormwater facilities on lot three, uh, a portion of the home and associated grading on lot four and the grading on lot five, but no structures. Um, you know, this, uh, um, this project evolved after we bought this property. We looked at a variety of alternatives, um, some being uh, much more intensive use of the, of the site or a much more intensive development of the site. Uh, we had multiple discussions early on, uh, decided that the OSRD bylaw uh, is, is a reasonable bylaw that allows us to consolidate the development, preserve the vast majority of the site and not have any wetland crossings or any significant wetland impact. So that's the route we took after looking at all of the alternatives. Um, and uh, I'm not gonna get into any technical details. Uh, Phil Henry from Civil Design Group is, is here uh, to go into a little bit more detail and uh, we're both available to answer questions uh, or, or, or clarify anything that needs clarification. Okay, thank you. Um, Let's start with uh, Bill Hull. In your perspective, is there anything uh, new to talk about? Um, yep, actually, I think I'd like to see uh, Phil Henry to uh, go over the changes he, they made in the plan so he can present uh, those, and then I can discuss a few comments that I have. But probably better off to start with uh, okay. Phil's presentation. Sure. <clears throat> okay, let's see that way. Uh, this is Phil Henry with Civil Design Group. Uh, so yeah, as, as indicated, th this site plan or this or this layout and, and grading schematic um, largely hasn't changed from what we submitted uh, before this uh, the RDA application a few months ago. If you recall, at that last hearing, um, Bill wanted us to follow up with some additional um, soil information, uh, particularly. Uh, providing some test pits uh, within the actual footprint of the infiltration area. Prior to uh, that hearing, we had uh, created transects or interpolated between test pits that were in and around that area, but nothing within that footprint. Um, so subsequent to that hearing, we, we did uh, some additional soil data uh, and we found that uh, groundwater was not encountered in the three additional test pits that were conducted within the infiltration system. Uh, so therefore we, we modified it slightly. We're a, we were able to shrink it uh, from, from a footprint standpoint, change the material from a Cultec plastic arches uh, to, to pipe. Um, and, um, uh, and, and actually lo uh, lowered it uh, and made it a more consistent um, stone elevation along the bottom as opposed to stepping it Per, per the previous design. Uh, that revised plan uh, was then resubmitted to, to planning board and, and reviewed by the, uh, um, I forget the gentleman's name, Joe. Joe uh, Tawaka. Yeah, their, 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 their um, engineer that, that reviewed the plans. Um, the comment letter that we received uh, outlined some minor changes that were required to not only the plant itself, but but also the grading of uh, or the or the stormwater, but nothing significantly impacting the overall stormwater approach, uh, and and he seemingly agreed with our uh, infiltration rate, uh, which also uh, um, Mr. Holt had asked us to to confirm at that at the prior RDA hearing. Um, so. Um, that's, that's generally the, the updates. The updates are we, we did some additional uh, soil data and we got a, a review letter that we responded to. We, we did not submit any plans associated with that because all of the comments were minor in nature and did not yield or warrant substantial site plan changes. So our, our goal is typically when we are before multiple departments is to gather all comments and issue a, a final letter so that that, or, or, excuse me, a final plan set so that that plan set can get finally reviewed uh, as opposed to submitting um, piecemeal plans uh, throughout the process. 
All right. Thank you. Um, well, now, Bill, do you want to turn? I will. <laughs> Let me share my screen. Can you all see that screen? Yep. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Great. All right. So for the most part, I, I do concur with, with um, the applicant's engineer that um, Joe's review, uh, my review of the, the drainage is that they did address most of my comments, if not all of them. Um, I do want to, I haven't seen Joe's comments yet. I'd like to take a look at those just to see if there's any issues that, you know, that he may have brought up that we can see. But for the most part, I, I think that the design is, is a good one, that it, it, it does seem to work. It meets the uh, stormwater management regulations. Um, so a lot of my previous comments were addressed. Um, the only other real issues I had with the plan is not significant, well, it could be significant. <laughs> uh, let me uh, get to the right sheet. Oops. Sorry, my screen's bouncing around a little. So what I noticed on the grading and the limit of work is that the limit of work, from what I can guess, is also the erosion control. Is that true? Yes, that's true. Yep. Okay. So in on lot five or unit five, your know, limit of work is, is quite a ways back. I assume that's to create the yard. Is the limit of work also going to be the, uh, I assume, would be the limit of tree clearing? That's yeah. correct. Yep. So from flags, is it B18, 19, and 20? It looks like you, well, B18 and 19 for sure. It looks like you're less than 25 feet. And I know that that's kind of a, a, a number that the commission looks for in terms of a, a closeness to the to the what well, wetland boundary. So I was wondering if that could be tweaked back some so that you're, you meet that 25 foot uh, limit uh, set back to the to the buffer zone. Uh, and that's one area. And the other area that I noticed it also, and it may not be workable, and this one is over here at flags uh, A. Uh, let me read it now. Looks like flags A17 and 16 and 15, those those three flags right there. Your, your grading is really close. I mean, I know you're doing, doing the grading to get the uh, path matched up. Yeah. All right, I just lost the page I was on. Uh, touch the screen. Yeah, there it is. Uh, there it was. Too much, it just jumps. <laughs> so yeah, I have some grading right in here. I don't know if there's any way of bringing that back a little, to get a little more separation there. Um, possibly a wall on the uh, up up side, uh, uphill side of that, or downhill side of that path, to maybe kind of limit that grading a little more. Uh, yeah, in that area. Um, but other than that, uh, I don't really have any other issues. It, it, they really addressed all the issues we had before, um, other than the closeness there. And I would recommend that we possibly have another site walk, um, mostly because not all the uh, commission members were at the last one. They couldn't all make it. And we also had snow cover, so we really couldn't see the wetland boundary line very well to, uh, it was secured with snow cover to be able to review that line. I know um, Mary was out there and we, we just, you know, you couldn't see, see much of the of the wetland boundary and the soils and vegetation out there. So it might be worthwhile to have one more site walk um, soon, um, sooner than later. That's really all I have for comments right now. Um, I'll open, I'll give, hand it back to the commission for their review and comments. All right, thank you, Bill. Uh, let's go around uh, the commission. Uh, Benjamin, what do you see? I'd say the one thing that 
is most sticking out to me and it was on the initial plans and it was on the site walk um, is uh, that same area that Bill pointed out in the northeast corner of the plans on lot five behind lots four and five there. Um, I think if you go to the second plan set sheet six, Bill, if you're driving right now. Right there. This one right here? Yeah, that one. Um, well, you can kind of see the elevations uh, in the plans that you have up now, but uh, it, it was kind of evident on the site walk too, it, is that it, you're, it's pretty much of a flat, slight downhill grade till you get to a certain point and then it keep, tips over into a steeper grade down to the wetland area. Um, and so right now it's kind of like on this, on this plan, you can see it's kind of like 95, 94, and then all of a sudden your next line, it's, uh, it's like 90, you have like a three foot drop, um, 91 and a half. And you can, on that straight line Bill was pointing out, you're kind of right on that 91 contour line. I'd really like to see the, just because I think you're getting to a thing with a grade issue there where having a yard, having work, we are cutting down trees and all this stuff, you're affecting the buffer pretty well. And you're going inside that 50 or the 25 foot, like Bill was saying, and you're doing it on the steeper grade that's gonna just channel things down to the wetland. So I'd really like to see something done there to bring the limit of work and any type of finished landscaping to that flatter part rather than the steeper part of uh, on that corner. Okay, uh, uh, this is Phil. Uh, can I can I respond to that, Mr. Chair? Um, yeah, that's that's okay. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, Ben, if I'm understanding you correctly, you're more concerned about the side yard of lot five or the rear of of unit four. I thought lot five was the topic that we discussed on site. I think wherever the cursor is right now, that's where I was talking about. Yeah. If I got okay. my lots mistaken, oh, I really yeah. apologize. Okay. That's lot five, correct? Yeah, yeah, because I think Bill was was pointing back towards unit four, yeah, which, was... which we really couldn't, we can't do anything over there. It's already she flow, which is what you want to do. So let me, I guess, let me explain why unit five, that that, that is graded uh, as, as such. And that is to, to, to minimize you know, in keeping with, you know, LID techniques, it, it's, it's an effort to, to minimize infrastructure there. So if you, if you look closely at the existing grade, the side, the, the, the I guess the, the north side of unit five, which is page up where that arrow is, Bill, right, right to the right. Yeah, right there. Th that, that, that existing area is a, is a little bit, is a slight null. So that existing grade is like 95 and change right where his mouse is. Um, so in, in, in lieu of adding a yard drain to, to make sure water doesn't uh, pitch towards the house uh, or create a low point and pitch it back into the street, we decided to, to, to regrade there. As you can see, that 94 is swelling into that retaining wall behind Unit 5 uh, and then is, is, is naturally being graded out. And it's, it's going to be, it's graded out just over 1%. So it's going to be a very flat area. So I'm not concerned of, of runoff. Uh, of any high velocities there because a the, the watershed contributing to it is very small plus it's a very level area but as uh, you know as as indicated the limit of work extends to that 92 contour in that area because that's that's the that's the trade-off that's where we have to go and, and and get that grade to to bring it back to get positive pitch plan north uh, hence hence the arrows there Yeah, I, th I think that. So what you're saying is that you're going to grade it so that everything goes down to the north. That's right. Yeah. Right. Which I'm saying will put all the water from that yard into the wetland, which I'm not thoroughly. I understand from an engineering and the house and the road and everything you're saying as an engineer that this is why you did that. I'm saying as somebody on the Conservation Commission who is interested in the health of the wetland, I'm not in love with that. Okay. Idea. Does that make sense to you? I understand why you like it makes perfect sense from an engineering standpoint. You're trying to keep the water away from the house and you don't want to put in a sewer line in because it's more infrastructure and everything. I'm a little bit worried about channeling runoff from a yard and everything else that's going on around the house directly into the wetland. So 
I may be overbearing in that, but that's my can that popped out at me. Does that make sense? Um, yes. Yeah, I understand. Yeah, but but um, the 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 contributing watershed is is not contaminated runoff. It's going to be rooftop and 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 grass. Yeah, and people do things in their yards that I sometimes shouldn't. It goes in wetlands, but maybe it'd be better if it didn't. Okay. Okay, hold on. I'm going to interrupt because this is the. Um, this doesn't feel like an easy thing to deal with. I think to oversimplify and maybe to uh, offer uh, an, an actionable thought, uh, perhaps Ben, uh, you're thinking that you're afraid of some linearity. And if there is a way to incorporate some sinuosity, maybe there'd be uh, a, something there. Is that uh, an actionable uh, thing? Are you afraid of straight line erosion or, are you, you know, would some sinuosity that would slow down the flow um, be the kind of conversation you would want to have? Or are you thinking of other things? I'm thinking erosion and nutrients. So, you know, I, I think in some ways I'd be more in favor with them putting in type, some type of infrastructure that did channel that water to the stormwater management system rather than back into the wetlands. Okay. Good. That's much clearer. And Sorry. we can work with that. Yep, sorry. Um, all right, so let's let that one sit for a little bit. Let's keep going around uh, the commission. Um, Bill Lord, anything from I don't you? Have any, no, I don't have any added comments. I think it seems to be the stuff we asked for a couple months ago. So I, I didn't go to the site walk, so I'm, like, I'm looking forward to that. Okay, uh, Daniel. Uh, nothing additional. Okay, Mary. Um, I don't. I don't have an objection to the grading of on lot five draining towards the wetland as long as there's a you know a decent undisturbed buffer. Um, it looks like it's fairly flat there, so you know I would like to try to maintain that twenty five foot separation and at the limit of work and. Um, so if you can look at that, I can't see all the grades on my screen. It's it, the um, gallery is blocking some of the um, some of the grading on the eastern side of the plan there. <clears throat> and also, I wanted to point out. Oh, thanks, Bill. Um, yeah, it's it's better. Yeah, so there's just a pinch point near um, flag B18, B19, that area that um, we can probably just create a little bit better separation right there and. <clears throat> that'll provide some better um, attenuation of any runoff that uh, from the yard uh, from that lot. And also, I just wanted to point out that DEP had comments on the infiltration system, and I don't know if these are related to the old design or the new design, but they had comments regarding the um, depth of groundwater and refusal and limited subsurface infiltration system profile data. Um, as it relates to existing and proposed topography, it does not support ability to provide the ground required separation. So I wonder if you could just, the applicant could address how they are addressing DEP's comment regarding sure. the infiltration system. Yeah, yeah, we're, we're aware of that comment. I'm not, um, typically when we get received comments from DEP, they are emailed to the applicant or the representative and uh, nor myself or Tom have received this comment, um, I noticed it uh, in periodically checking the website uh, to get a DEP number. Um, so, however, I don't I don't understand the question. Not your question. I don't understand their their comment. Um, we we feel that we we meet the DEP stormwater standards. Um, so it could be, I mean, it could be them not understanding the plans or not seeing the detail or so. Um, I, I don't, I don't understand the question, nor do I know who, who asked it. So, um, right. So usually it goes to the, you know, the stormwater reviewer. It's, it's not very well worded. I yeah. understand. So it's, it's, it's unclear. Um, but it looks like they're just questioning that th there is enough profile data to be able to, to show that you've got the required separation to groundwater, which is what two feet you need from the bottom of the yeah, system. It's two, 
it's two feet and, and groundwater was not encountered in the in the three additional test pits that we have done. Perhaps maybe mm -hmm. they were looking at some older test pits, although I don't know right. why, because we've only submitted one plan set to the notice of intent. But in cases like these, we 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 defer to you know the local peer reviewer. Um, right. I would just suggest though, because DEP's been more active about intervening in projects lately, um, that they that you provide a response to them, um, both in by email and in uh, in writing, how you how you respond to that between yourself, Bill Holt, and um, Joe Stawatka. I think you can probably agree upon um, some language that would be appropriate. Okay, Bill. Do you know who? Um, do you know who potentially who who may have reviewed this at the state? I, I don't, but I can find out probably pretty quickly for you. Okay, because I actually tried to call the office, and as you would imagine, there, there's nobody there. You can't. Yeah. Yeah, they're not. They're not. Um, Tom McGuire usually makes the stormwater comments, but um, I I don't I don't know who which reviewer would have been the one to make that comment. And it, and it could be an older comment from the original filing. I'm not sure. No, because this would have been that you, you no, did an RDA before, science. so that wouldn't yeah. be the case. Okay, so this would be for this filing, yeah. That's right. Um, okay. Um, Um, I don't have any more right, comments. So, no, thank you. Okay. Yeah, that felt like a pregnant pause. I didn't know if there was going to be more talking. Um, all right. Uh, Peter, anything more uh, on your end? No, nothing at this time. Thanks. Okay. Uh, I'm also a little uh, comment free. Um, you know, as I did miss the site visit, and a lot of this has to do with, you know, the topography on the back. So maybe I'm fair on the next site visit. Um, I'll have something to say. Um, okay, so then let's see. Anything from the public? Anybody here for this one? Doug DeAngelis is raising his hand. And Amanda hey. is another one. We do have people here. All right, let's turn over the floor. Who's, um, who raised their hand first? Mr. DeAngelis. Hi, um, I, I wouldn't say, I wouldn't say, I'm obviously not here for this, but I'm curious. Um, <clears throat> do you have a plan that shows the extent of the open space? And, and uh, does, um, do you, is it clear yet who holds the open, who will hold the open space? Uh, there, there is a plan that, that, that depicts the open space. That's uh, sheet, Bill, I think it's sheet six. Um, and, and who is going to hold the open space that has not been determined. That's going to be part of the, I guess, in, in part, the, the planning board process. Am I on mute? Okay, thanks. No, that, that's, that's perfect. Um, so I'll, I'll just put in a shameless plug for Greenbelt since um, I have <laughs> been on the board for 20 years and was former president. So... <laughs> <laughs> it's a it's a it's an interesting area um, with some with some potential for uh, for linking things up. So um, it, it'd be nice if it wasn't held by a uh, homeowners association. That's my primary concern. Okay. Um, hey, Brian, could point. I just jump in on that for one second, just to clarify? Uh, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, it, the the intent in any case is, is not for a homeowners association to hold it. That's 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 not our intent. Cool. Thanks. Can I can I ask a follow up question? Thanks, Brian. Go ahead. No, I just because I forgot I, that was one thing I didn't see in here. Which and if I missed it, I wanted to make sure I didn't miss it. Was um because it was a something we talked about in the previous one it was an RDA. Was there anything in here to provide parking for people to access that didn't live on the street to access the open space? 
Um, we're working on that in discussion with the planning board primarily. Thank you, Tom. Yeah. Um, all right, and uh, Kathy, you said there's another uh, general public with their hand in the air. Mr. Krugman, there you are. I see the wave. Thank you, I appreciate this. Um, I, I feel like I'm a little bit late to this party because I do not believe I was notified about the previous uh, discussions between uh, the developer and the plan and the commission rather. Um, but I have some basic and maybe naive questions uh, as an abutting neighbor who may be impacted by the development. Uh, and I'm asking this more, initially as a point of information because I don't fully understand the technological issues that have been discussed tonight. But, um, but it seems pretty clear that lot four and lot five significantly encroach upon the 100 foot buffer zone. And my question to the commission is, what is the function of this buffer zone? And is the encroachment upon it a violation of that function? And that's a point of information. Beyond that, I have a question about the impact of changing the buffer zone to accommodate these buildings. And what impact will that have on a neighboring property such as mine, which floods, uh, you know, it's every, uh, time it really rains heavily, my our backyard uh, floods. And uh, fortunately, our house has not flooded yet, but the yard floods. And I'm wondering whether this development will displace the watershed in such a way that might cause flooding on neighboring properties. And if that were to happen, what recourse the neighboring properties would have to the uh, currents of flooding. So that, that's my first question. Uh, can I stop there? I have another question to follow up with. Um, well, hold on there, because your first question is actually more like 17 questions all sort of nestled together with Russian dolls. Um, there's a lot built in there. Um, I think to, to oversimplify the first answer, the buffer zone, uh, is when regulatory jurisdiction kicks in for the compound and that 100 foot buffer when you get to sort of foot zero that's when you actually hit the wet and everything from 100 to zero is just sort of why we're having this conversation in a manner of speaking and um your point about uh changing the hydrology changing uh, the flow of water you know etc cetera, etc cetera. um much of our discussions uh Thinks along those similar lines, right? We're, um, you may have caught Ben uh, asking about the impact of flow off the backyard to the wetland just from there in a very detailed um, spot. And, you know, so your concern about what changes and what doesn't is something that we are trying to, you know, uh, if we can't, you know, address necessarily, uh, but we are sort of asking the questions that um, would address those and we would find out arguably if there's going to be much of a change uh, and you know again with a very broad stroke um, compared to uh, the development that could have gone in this spot um, relatively speaking this shouldn't affect that um, detail um, compared to something that could have gone on the, uh, the space you know uh, as you may have uh, heard uh, the open space aspect of it and keeping so much of it in open space. Um, the open space is the sponge that absorbs the rain and uh, keeps the water levels at, uh, at those you're accustomed to. And so, uh, you know, on, on a grand scale, there shouldn't be a change. You know, there may be some localized changes, uh, but they would probably be uh, closer to uh, the properties themselves you know, the, the development itself rather than um, at a distance. Um, that being said, um, and hopefully that answered at least some of your question, um, 
Yeah, keep going. You've got more on your mind. Oh, uh, can I just follow up to that point? And so what you're saying is that uh, development on within the 100 foot buffer zone is not a big deal. That you're okay with that? No, it's just that um, it's a very common thing. And our job in this space is to make sure that the, the development within the 100 foot buffer isn't um, egregiously damaging to the wetland and uh, impactful. You know, by definition, development will be impactful, but we're just trying to sort of keep it reasonable. Okay. Can I ask Mr. Klugman where, where your property is located? I'm sorry, I didn't properly introduce myself. Um, I'm Martin Krugman and I live at uh, 19 Coleman Road. So we are uh, a driveway across from the proposed development on the same across side the of street. Coleman. Across the street? No, we're not okay. across the street. We're on the same side of the street as the development. There are 15 Coleman, uh, there's a 17 Coleman and I'm at 19 Coleman. Got it, okay, thank so, you. So uh, basically our uh, yard and driveway if you look over 17 Coleman's driveway, we're looking at the development um, and it's really in our front yard. Um, the, uh, the second question that I have, again, this comes from a lot of naivete, uh, but the notion of having seven properties, seven developed buildings, four family, um, I'm sorry, uh, four bedroom homes on a four and a half acre property without sufficient uh, sewage control such that they are required to consolidate the sewage from these multiple properties in a combined unit uh, and locating it on one or two of the lots as the effluent. I I'm concerned, <laughs> to accept that I understand this, I'm concerned about well contamination because I'm just a few hundred feet from that sewage field. And I'm concerned about what impact that will have on our well. We don't have city water in our home, we have a well. And so, and, and so does many of our neighbors. So I'm just curious whether the, um, whether the work done by the professionals who uh, the developer has been working with uh, has have developed a sewage system that pretty much guarantees that there will be no contamination of local wells. We're talking about uh, so, so, seven buildings in a four and a half acre location. Can I take a crack uh, at that, Brian? Yeah, yes. no, I just okay. wanted to say that the this septic design is the Board of Health's purview and would not be something the Conservation Commission would be involved with. And in um, is outside of our area of jurisdiction. So a very, only a very small portion of this project is within the jurisdiction of the Conservation Commission. It's only the part that's within the 100 feet of the wetland. So the only the 100 foot buffer zone is the only, the only part of the project that we're able to review. I so see. it's just a small amount of grading that, and part of the, um, the, the infiltration system and some grading and, and some um, some of the land grading on lots four and five and the infiltration system. So we're really very limited in what we can comment on on this project because much of the work is outside of our, our geographic jurisdiction. So the planning board um, and the board of health would both weigh in on, on issues that the conservation commission can't weigh in on. I see. Well, um, and Mary, do you want to just follow it up with, uh, I, I presume you've uh, had a conversation once or twice about groundwater hydrology and how the that interacts between BOH and CONCOM. Do you want to go down that rabbit hole a little bit for him? Well, the, this septic system has to be designed according to Title V requirements. So it is presumed if it's designed according to the state requirements that it protects groundwater. Um, the drainage, the surface drainage and surface runoff is pretty much towards the back of the site, directed to the back of the site towards the wetlands. Mm -hmm. So not towards your property. Um, and they have to demonstrate that the rate of runoff off the property is no greater than what it is prior to construction. So they have to model the, the stormwater runoff from the site so that it doesn't exceed um, 
pre-construction conditions. And that has been reviewed by the planning board's um, engineering consultant, as well as the conservation commission's um, agent, who's a professional engineer as well. And so I presume that that's been approved. It has, nothing's been process. approved yet. Yeah, yeah. we're nothing. Yeah, it hasn't been approved. There's still comments that are being addressed in, in the final design of of the. Um, the drainage system and the grading plan for this project. So I think the commission was leaning towards ha having another site visit. Is that correct? Do we want to discuss whether we want to go ahead and have have that scheduled? Um, yeah, that seems reasonable. Uh, but let's just, uh, Mr. Krugman, you're, uh, does that work for you? Is that take care of what's on your mind? Um, you know, I appreciate the work of this commission to, uh, you know, figure it, figure this out. And um, I'm not trying to be obstructionistic. I'm just trying to um, understand what's happening in my neighborhood. And it's qu quite a, uh, a development for our rural environment to have seven buildings on four and a half acres right next door to us and while it is wonderful that the developer is preserving uh the re remaining segment of this what 27 acres or something um the four and a half acres closest to our house um is for me an urbanization of our neighborhood um and it's not exactly what I had hoped for when I moved out to the what I thought was the country. So um, that's my overarching concern here. And uh, I, I do have a concern that this is too many houses on too small a property, but maybe that's not your purview. So I, I thank you for listening to me. Well, you know, we're, we're always happy to have people come in and talk to us. It keeps us, you know, and talking to each other too much um <laughs> but um you know we we understand where you're coming from and we you know we do want to make sure that to the extent we can we can um communicate and answer and you know provide you know to the, to the best of our abilities um okay so then uh amanda is there anybody and, else amanda and dale answer? mccausley i think it's mccausley uh, I'm not seeing them, but they can have the floor if they can. They hear me. are on the list. I can't get them on the screen. Hi, this is Dale McCausland at 27 Coleman Road. Uh, I called in earlier just to get the link. I do. I do not have a question. Thank you. Oh, okay. Thank you. Uh Thank you. Um, well, then, uh, is there anybody else with their hand up? I'm not seeing anybody. Going once, going twice for public commentary. And okay. The chair. All right, back to the commission. Um, all right, so this leaves us where we need uh, a site visit. Mr. Uh, Chairman, this is, uh, uh, yeah. this, is th this is Phil Henry. Can I, in an effort to respond to Bill's comments, could I, could I just respond to his grading comments? I, I have a, and I just wanted to ask the commission something about behind lot five in an effort to make progress on, on, on the plan. Yeah, I'm, I'm okay. In progress. So, we'll um, so, so with re with regards to the grading associated with the trail that is clearly within 25 feet. Uh, Bill uh, is correct that that grading is within uh, 25 feet on on the westerly edge there to 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 simply reconnect that trail that that trail um, extends in a in a straight fashion and and would go up a steeper section of that hill if you will so where you see the 74 contour and the 76 contour most closely related to those wetlands it's it's in an effort to keep a constant slope. So if you look at the contour interval from 74 
up to uh, 892, I try to keep a consistent vertical longitudinal slope so that as someone's walking, they can walk on a more consistent slope. Because of that though, the catch up zone on the north side or the top, uh, page top, if you will, um, as you can see, I tried to peel those contours back as fast as possible without having the need for the wall because I also don't want a vertical change for someone walking in that area such that uh, somebody may get hurt from, from a fall protection. So I, I try to strike, you know, um, you know, trying to, to grade it as tight as we could. That's a, that's a three to one fill slope there on the north side of that wall, uh, but also combining, making sure that there's a reasonable connection back into the site for, for that trail system. So I, I'm, I'm not sure what we can do there to significantly reduce the, the impact in, in that 25 foot without, without el simply eliminating the trail, which I don't think anybody would like. Uh, we, we could explore putting some smaller walls there, but I, I, I don't think we're gonna be able to get out of the 25 because the, <laughs> simply the, the trail connection is within the 25 foot. So. Mm -hmm. uh, but I'm happy to work with Bill and maybe we can talk about it more on the site visit. Uh, but I just wanted to kind of gauge and, or, or set the fact that we, we may not be able to get out of the 25 without disconnecting that trail system. And then um, going back to uh, lot, uh, the grading behind unit five, um, correct me if I'm wrong, but did I hear if, if there's an opportunity to to uh, maintain a 25 foot buffer uh, proximate to that swale graded, is that something that the commission would be agreeable upon uh, as opposed to uh, putting a yard drain in that side yard? If I, can, if I could positively drain that plan north and maintain a 25 foot buffer, is that something that the commission would be um, agreeable to, or, 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 or is the commission just dead set on having, having a yard drain to, to collect water there? Uh, ben, I think this one, right. That's your, uh, comment, right? Yeah, I think so. Um, and I mean, so it's just my, <laughs> if it's just my comment, it's just my comment, Bill. And so only oh, do that. Um, yeah, I, I think it's something we can talk about, maybe better to visualize on the on the site walk also. Um, and I think we did talk about it a little bit on the site walk out there. Um, I think that, yes, there, I think there's ways to get around a, a yard drain. It may be replanting that area with vegetation. You know, if the, if the, if the limit of work is there, okay, the limited work is there and you have a temporary disturbance. But maybe the you you have landscaping plans that show that the eventual yard does not go over that slope, but is constrained to the flatter area, and that you're going to revegetate with native uh, flora on that once that starts to slope down to the wetland. Does that make sense to you? Sure. Yeah. Something yeah, like we, that. Yeah, we can definitely. Yeah, because the back of Unit Five is going to is going to the roof drains are going to are going to daylight at the at the at the grass level, and so so that whole backyard of unit five is not going into the infiltration system. So if we were to collect the yard drain, I would simply just be looking to, to, to discharge it on the slope anyway, because I'm not, I don't want to bring, that's clean runoff that I don't want to bring into the infiltration system. So I thought that, you know, this was a, I guess the, the, the um, an ideal situation to keep it surface and have it, have it grade so flat that the vegetation in and of itself will be um, sort of like the, the water quality treatment, if you will, if, if there's in fact, you know, if they put down lime or, 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 or whatever. Um, yeah, so, you know, I, I think it's just, you know, maybe we can work on some, some landscaping plans that, you know, I, when I see a limit of work on, on new housing, I typically assume that that's gonna end up being where yeah. the limit of work is yeah, we Yeah, we can work with revegetating closer to the limit of work, as long as we can keep positive pitch and not creating any like surficial berm or anything between the wetlands and and the swale, but just 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 planting it on grade would 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 be would work for, you know for us. Yeah, let's let's talk about it on site. Okay, um, I, All right, I think that's uh, solutions. Hey uh, Brian, uh, could I jump in for one second on that just to just to add a comment? Um, Absolutely. <laughs> all right. Yeah, the revegetation is a great idea, uh, and 
uh, you know, again, I think we've discussed this on site, but even whether we put a fence or even a stone wall as a barrier that's that's even even uh, further from further from that uh, that that wetland uh, connection uh, after we revegetate. That, that's certainly something that I've done in the past uh, and I'm happy to do. Um, and, and I think it's a good way of, of creating a, a you know a, a permanent a permanent barrier to change down the road. Thank you. Those are great ideas. Go ahead. Well, um, there we go. Progress. Love it. Um, so where does this leave us? This leaves us with uh, the need for a site walk, right? So anybody want to kick a date around? Ready? You want me to do it? Or we haven't done it. Next next week. Week. All right. Great. No weekend. Not for the next two, anyways. Well, the sun is up late during the the midweek now too, so it's a whole other story. Um, does anyone want to uh, be? Do you want to do this as a midweek thing? Would that be okay? Do we want to leave them out of it? And make them go by himself? No. Anybody want to? No. Nothing. Um. All right, then I'm just going to make up a date and the time and see what people, how you react. Um, how about the 14th of April at noon? Oh, come on, people. Somebody speak up. Um, I, I would suggest that we do it a little earlier so that if we do to give the uh, applicant some time to make any plan revisions and get it to us a week before the meeting. So if we could do it sooner than later, that would probably be good for them. Um, if we're talking about it, it, April 20th is our next meeting. Mm -hmm. yeah. right. we, so we'd want to have it by the third uh, revised plans by the 13th. So I would suggest we do something the week of um, next week. April, the week of April 5th. Beautiful. I'm glad that I'm not the new one talking. So um, wait, sorry, I can do off. Wednesday evening, Thursday evening. Yeah. Um, all right, let's, let's um, how about Thursday? How's that look for everybody? Thursday, and by evening we mean five? five? That's fine with me. Thursday the 8th? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yep. I, 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 could, I could do that. How long do we anticipate the, the walk? Um, Less than an hour. Yeah. Yeah. Better Sunset is around seven. <laughs> okay. Thursday the eighth at five. Okay. Thursday the eighth. Works. Okay. Uh, we'll I make a motion right. to continue the meeting until April 20th. That should be all, all three meetings. All, all three, three meetings. Oh, yeah. yeah. Well, no. Yes. Yeah. We have to we have to go through all three and do three separate votes. So, um, we open them all together, can't we? Move, yeah. Extend yeah, them all together. You could probably do all at the same time. Just yeah. reference all three. <laughs> all right, let's try it. I mean, whatever. So somebody needs to second Mary. Second. second. All right, excellent. Roll call, Benjamin. Yes. Uh, Bill, Lord, yes, Daniel, yes, Mary, yes, Peter, yes, also, yes, for me. All right, great. And we'll so thank you guys. We will see you out in the field, and then we'll see you uh, again for the next one. Thank, thank you all very much for the time, much appreciated. Take care. All right. Brian, Brian the right good news is, <clears throat> Brian, the next next um, item on the agenda has been 
um, ask for a continuance. The applicant asked for a continuance um, due to the fact they have no DEP number. Um, they're trying to work that out. So they um, sent an email earlier today asking for a continuance to the next meeting, uh, April 20th. Awesome. I like the way that you saved the good news for the middle. Um, <laughs> all right. So then uh, we'll open and we'll continue and we'll move on. So then uh, Dwayne Cromwell, 11 Jackson Way, DEP number, they still don't have one. Uh, an NOI to perform renovations on an existing single family dwelling continued from March the 9th. And uh, who would like to make a motion to continue this till April the 20th at 7 p.m.? So moved. Second. Second. Thank you. Who made, the first motion, please? who made the first motion, please? Peter. Oh, Peter. All right, roll call. Benjamin. Yes. Bill Lord. Yes. Daniel. Yes. Mary. Yes. And Peter. Yes. And I will also vote yes. Yeah. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, moving on, we have Vincent uh, Godden, the Cottages Commercial LLC, 2 Old Point Road, DEP number 050-1344, a notice of intent to do redevelopment work at site to create a new restaurant, outdoor seating, a movable kitchen, and 54 new parking spaces. All right. Uh, what is new? Hi, good evening, Steve. Sorry with Design Consultants Inc. I'm here with Vincent Godin. Um, I think uh, I can share the screen if you'd like. Um, at the yeah. I'm just trying to find you so I can do it. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know where you went. I saw you a second ago. Oh, there you are. All set. You, you should be all set. All set? Yep. Okay. Um, so I think we were pretty much all, I thought at the end of the meeting, I, I think I felt the consensus of the commission was that everyone was okay with with what we were proposing. Um, we actually had paved, we had new pavement in this area. Um, and then uh, did that jump to the landscape plan? Now it is. It's a, is the landscape plan up now? Yes. Okay, yeah. And then this area was uh, permeable paver and we had a Gabian wall here. Uh, there were comments uh, from, comments had just uh, come in from DEP regarding um, the allowance of any new pavement in the, um, on the project and also pavers uh, in the Gabian wall didn't conform to Dune standard. Now, you know, I guess we are removing an, ex an extensive amount of pavement on the property. Um, and, uh, well, so there was an extensive amount of pavement removed, but we didn't really get any credit. I, I think after that meeting, my charge was to find out who the reviewer was and, and see where they stood with it. If they're firm on it, we, we really can't afford intervention. Uh, I did finally find out it was Mike Abel. Um, and I did get one email. I was reaching out to coordinate with them. And the only email I got back from him was saying that they were not working in the office and could not talk on the phone. They could not take a phone call. So um, I followed with five or it was probably seven emails over the next week regarding detailed questions regarding the paving and the pavers and other means to handle it. Unfortunately, there was no response from him. Um, so we basically took a stance, okay, we'll change this area here We've removed the pavement. So this is now a compacted stone dust surface, which can meet ADA compliance, a smooth surface, smooth rolling surface that will require some ongoing maintenance that Vincent will have to provide. Uh, if there's any rutting in there, we'll have to make sure it stays smooth. Also the, um, the drive apron was changed to a uh, compacted stone dust surface. Um, one item is, also, what happened was during the planning board review, the Merrimack Planning, um, uh, Merrimack Valley Planning Commission recommended changing the access, the um, 
the one-way drive instead of entering off of Plumon Boulevard to enter off of um, Old Point. Well, we didn't particularly agree with that just for the fact that most people coming, they'll see it on Old, on Plumon Boulevard. It may leave, leave, lead to confusion, but most likely there'll be repeat customers here and such so they get used to it and you know run through with this circulation. Their concern was any cars queuing to take the left would back cars up because it's not uh, Plum Island Boulevard's a little may not be wide enough for the cars to swing around. Whereas if they're queued to take a left uh, left in to go into the restaurant here, they can swing around. So hence we ended up acquiescing and rerouting it and had the entry off of Old Point and the exit there. So that's um, an operational change, nothing to do conservation wise. And then also on the on the um, landscape plan, we changed this permeable paver surface, uh, permeable paver surface to the the wood wood decking surface uh, to match that. So basically, we we made those changes, um, resubmitted the plans, and just hoping um, hoping that that will appease the DEP, so we won't see any uh, have any intervention. Uh, upon hopefully receiving the order conditions from the Newbury Conservation Commission. So there's, you know, there's the changes in a nutshell. I'm hoping that, um, hoping that the commission is okay with those changes um, to, to address the DEP concerns. And that is All it. right, thank you. Um, Bill Holt, you wanna follow up? Yep, I um, actually have no issues. I, I think that they have addressed the concerns that we had, uh, that the DEP had um, adequately. So I'm satisfied. I would say that um, one condition that we should include in the order conditions would be that the soil testing for the stormwater min mitigation areas be done uh, on the onset of the demolition and pavement rule so that they can get those at that and if any changes that need to be made, they can make them, you know, uh, relatively soon. Um, so I don't really anticipate there will be any changes, but there could be. So just in case, <laughs> that's my only only comment. I'll hand it back to the commission for any questions they have. Okay. Thank you, Bill. Uh, let's go around the horn, Benjamin. I don't have anything. Um, trying to remember if we had any conditions from the previous meeting that we wanted to keep in my mind, but nothing's coming right now. So I have nothing new. Okay, uh, Bill. I have no additional comments. Okay, uh, Daniel. All set. Uh, Mary. I'm all set. Oh, Peter. Uh oh. <laughs> so I don't know if this one. Uh, you know, when you look at a project, you know, you keep on looking and looking, and you start thinking more stuff. So. Uh, do we have anything about the sand that's going to be imported in here? Do we have any, you know, stipulations as to that sand and how it's processed or what it's like or anything like that? Mary, is that anything that you'd be up on? Uh, yeah, it just needs to be consistent with what's what sand that's on Plum Island. So I think we can make a special condition that it be clean sand that's consistent in grain size with the, you know, with what's there on the barrier. That's it. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Yep. Thanks. Oh, man, Pete, I'm glad somebody spoke up because I was, you know, it's bad for him to have no questions, right? <laughs> you had plenty of the past time. <laughs> um, yeah, um, I don't think I have any comments. You know, the, um, the, the comment I made last time about the height of the dunes that'd be constructed and, you know, just sort of the sort of the micro topography of the, um, um gardening i don't i don't know if that's the right way to frame it uh yeah that was just my point of interest but it's nothing um nothing that i think rises to any kind of conversation point so um bill holt do you recall did we have any uh thing we talked about last meeting that we need to be reminded of i any don't recall any. Or... all right uh, I, I don't recall any i think we were talking in the uh standing conditions and then uh, I would just include the testing and, and the uh, type of sand that uh, Mary just 
<laughs> okay. Uh, well, let's uh, turn to the public. Is anybody here to speak to this project? Going once, going twice. All right, no public commentary. Um, and yeah, so. All right, anybody want to make a motion? Do wait, well, hold on a second. Wait, do, is there any more permits that these guys have out that we need to worry about changing the plan? Do we need to hold this open and wait for other people? I, we're still in planning, but I think we're we're pretty close. We're just resolving. There was some. I think it's just awaiting peer review and traffic comments. I don't see anything that would change change the project at that point. At this point, we've had multiple meetings with planning. Um, I think three meetings with them, and I think we're we're pretty close to to finishing that up. That wouldn't result in any any plan change that would impact this um, the conservation filing. All right. Um, well, the men are speaking. If if we all believe them, we can move this forward. And if you want to wait and see if uh, planning is going to change anything, we can wait. But um, we prefer yeah, not to, I, if it's possible. <laughs> Pete, do you want to uh, comment on that particular detail? Uh, no, no, no additional comments for me at this time. Thanks. Um. Well, what's the pleasure of the board? The floor is open for motion. I make a motion to approve the project with the special conditions um, mentioned by Bill to include the test pit um, after removal of the pavement in the buildings, test pit um, to confirm the uh, soil conditions for the stormwater system and that the any material brought on site, um, sand material will be consistent in grain size with what is on the barrier island now. And then I, I think you'd have the standard pre-construction conditions for um, inspections at the you know prior to commencement of construction. Is that correct, Bill? Yep. Okay. I That's would second motion. that. I would second that. All right. Roll call. Uh, Benjamin? Yes. Bill Lord? Yes. Daniel? Yes. Mary? Yes. And Peter? Yes. All right. And I will also vote in the affirmative. Um, do you Thank guys you. want the, uh, the script on, you know, appeals and that whole process? Are you pretty familiar with that whole thing? I think we're familiar enough. Yep. Okay, good. I, I expected this much, but good to check. Um, all right. Well, then, um, thank you. And, uh, you know, we'll look forward to seeing how things progress. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. All right. Moving right along, we have Kevin Whitney of KR Construction Company, LLC, at 84 Boston Road, DEP number 050 1337. A continued NOI to construct a 7,400 square foot building with two paved access driveways, paved parking and access on three sides of the building, and a gravel storage area to the rear and side of the building. Continued from March 9th. Uh, all right, Mr. Whitney. Hello. There you are. And, and there's Chris York. All right. Um, why don't you guys introduce yourself for anybody new to the, the scene, and then you can fill us in on what's new. Okay, I'm Chris York with Millennium Engineering and Kevin Whitney, the applicant, is here as well. At the last hearing, Kevin had basically asked the board, you know, what, you know, what the board wanted to see for a buffer <coughs> zone that would be suitable, you know, suitable to the board to get us an approval, basically. And what the board came back with was 25 feet. So Kevin decided to chop off 10 feet off the size of this building. If I can share the screen here. Can I, I got my desktop computer open as well. Uh, might be under my wife's name. Yep. That's where I got the uh, 
plans that I can share. Rebecca, you up? Yep. There we go. Should be good. There we go. All right, so we have gone from a 74 by 100 building to 65 by 100 building. That allowed us to take, I'll say, take nine feet off the back of the building and also take you know, nine to 10 feet off of the back parking area. So the wall, I'll just show this plan we had up before. So we're now holding 25 feet to the back of the wall in all locations. So we have a, you know, we're holding the tree line as close as we can to the back of the wall as well. Well, I'm hoping at this at this case, I'm hoping that is uh, you know, the board is looking for. It's not, it seems like that's what the case was, but you know, we've got 25 feet, and I guess that that's about all I get to add. I can certainly take any questions. Okay, Chris, thank you. Um, let's go around the horn. Uh, Benjamin, you want to start? Thank you, Chris. I will start by saying that I've been continually impressed by your um, New England sports team paraphernalia at all meetings. Consistent I, <laughs> I love it. Um, thank you. Um, it's good to see all this. It is, you know, at the end of the day, what we asked for. I appreciate that. Um, this plan set does not show a limit of work. How far in past 25 feet? Can you remind me, do you, you think that um, you'll go in order to get the wall in? I'm using the tree line as basically the limit of work. So we're, you know, probably another five feet in, so, you know, so the limit of work would be about 20 feet. You know, we can, anything that's disturbed behind there can be, you know, will be uh, replenished. We, we originally had shown a buffer, you know, a, some buffer zone plantings in there originally. And they were taken out. You know, we can certainly add some back in if the board wants. We don't. I mean, it's not a thick tree line out there. We, you know, any trees that are out there, we you know that we can save. We will in that area. You know, any that have to come down, we can certainly replenish. You know, in kind with similar trees. You know, yeah, I just. I appreciate that, Chris. I, I know just in walking the um, the Ligulus piece next door and around that area, there's just so many invasives in the area already. My only fear would be, you know, if you're just leaving disturbed soil there, that it would just be an easy way for them to get established on this property, too. So anything to just kind of try and get something covered up with uh, floor that would be appropriate for the area. Yep. prior and not just leave disturbed dirt inside the you know past the boundary of the wall would be good but yeah that's my only thought i think yeah i think i had a note too yeah there's a note at the back here a eh? area disturbed behind wall during construction shall be repaired with woman seed just behind the wall yeah I, if anybody else on the board has input onto what should be planted there i'm yeah, i'd be willing to hear it but that's my only thought Thank you, Chris, and thank you, Kevin. You're welcome. All right, thanks, Ben. Uh, Bill Lord? No, I'm, I'm good with all the changes. I think they've tried to do everything we've asked for. Okay. Um, Daniel? Yeah, so uh, I just have some question. Um, th there are a number of large trees in that buffer zone area we're talking about. And I'm just sort of wondering how you approach I mean, what's too close to a tree where you start getting into the root system where you're going to put your wall in? How do you decide what tree has to go? Do you leave the root system there? If it, you know, it might be some of those trees might have to go even though they're, you know, 12 feet from the wall. I'm just wondering how you approach that thing, that idea. Any um, any trees on the downhill side of the wall will remain. Um, obviously, any on the uphill side of the wall on the building side, they would have to be removed due to the grade change changing. 
but the the goal is to keep any trees on the on the wetland side of the wall yeah i mean i understand that it sounds good but um you know if you're going to get into the root system in a major way um you know, and you're because you have to have stable ground underneath the wall. I'm just sort of wondering if if there was some more clarity to that question. It sounds like you're just going to try to keep what you can. Uh, so maybe that's that answers my question um, on that. And just yeah, I I don't think loam and seed is what you want in there. It's it's going to be deep shade behind the wall and I just, uh, you know, some, some more herbaceous, you know, more shrubbery kind of thing might, might work there if it was uh, shade tolerant. Okay, we can go, yeah, we can do something different, you know, some sort of shade tolerant. Uh... Mark West might have a better idea what can be planted better out there. Some shade tolerant uh, uh, wildlife seed mix or something that doesn't uh, doesn't need to be mowed or anything. Just kind of grows naturally. We uh, previously had a shrub planting scheme for the buffer, like Chris said. Typically, what uh, I recommend is the native shrub in the wetland system already. I believe we had northern airwood and silky dogwood. Um, winterberry can do good in, in, in uh, shady areas also. So we would probably do a native wetland shrub mix and use the similar species that I think Chris had a plan for. And we would just use the square footage of that five foot wide by the linear feet plant them every eight feet or so. And um, I, I believe that that's on a, a previous plan, correct, Chris? It was, yeah, it was about a three, it was about a 3,000 square foot area. I think we showed about 15 shrubs, trees in that area. So we could certainly do something similar if that's what the commission would like to see. Um, I'm all set, buddy. Okay. Um, thanks, Tim. Is it is it possible that maybe maybe Mark West could answer Dan's question about the large trees and the impact that the construction of the wall might have on those large trees in terms of the root? Uh, typically, the root? typically, a rule of thumb is if you can preserve fifty percent of the root system, then the tree can survive. Uh, and I built a outdoor uh, riding ring on my property next to a very large oak tree. Half of the system, uh, root system was left and that oak tree is still there. And there's a about a five foot cut right next to it with no problem the growth. So the, the key will be uh, whether it, if you have maybe a tree at that corner where it loses more, but anything along the uh, straight line with the wetland boundary that you're just removing half of the uh, root system or less, the tree will be fine. So that's the rule of thumb we use. Thank you. All right, so um, Dan, if you're good, we'll move on to uh, Mary. Um, I don't see an erosion control boundary on here. Am I missing it? Um, I don't see it at the limit of work. Is it there? I see a 10 foot offset, but I don't see. On, on okay, the there it is. Thank you. All right, yeah. and, and then <clears throat> My next question is, is your 25 foot setback, does that, that does not apply to the stormwater basin then? You don't, you only have- No, it does not. limit of grading. It's only to the wall. 
Yeah, okay. Yeah, for the wall, yep. Tough to write right the right. road here. The okay. basin itself rates pretty close to the edge of wetlands. Right close I there, yep. And then that basin discharges to an ACEC, and I know I had mentioned to Bill that um, I, I was questioning whether or not the stormwater um, design anticipated discharge from ACEC. Did you, did you accommodate, are you accommodating the full, what is it, half inch that you need to do for, for an yeah, ACEC? Yep, yep, yep. You've got that covered, okay. Do, yep. And then <clears throat> um, I would suggest that that we um, have a special condition to tag any trees to be removed prior to removal. So Bill, that you can take a take a look at them and, and make a determination whether you think that's acceptable. Um, I agree with the planting plan that Mark West described with um, native wetland shrubs, five foot wide, eight foot on center along the perimeter between the wall and the wetland edge. Um, if we don't have a specific planting plan, I think we can probably describe that as a special condition. Okay, and then um, having a shade tolerant conservation seed mix to, to provide the temporary <coughs> soil stabilization as well. And I think those were all my comments. Okay, thanks, Thank Mary. Um, Peter, hey, did uh, Bill Bill Holt? Did you have any uh, comments before we started this discussion that you wanted to make for the commissioners? Um, the only comment I had is I I had spoken with um, Martha, the planner, and I believe maybe you can correct me, Peter, if I'm wrong. There was a concern on the potential contamination dripping off of the vehicles in the gravel areas of the parking where the vehicles will be stored. Um, and they had, I guess they you had talked with them at the planning board meetings as to whether that should be paved or not. And my understanding is they don't want it paved because they're gonna be driving uh, track heavy track vehicles over that area and it would just end up destroying the pavement. So it's better not to be paved than to have a continuing maintenance problem with, with uh, vehicles driving over it. Um, I guess the concern was, say again, any type of fluids coming off these vehicles that would get into the soil and then ultimately into the groundwater and potentially be uh, filtering out towards the wetlands. Um, so my suggestion would be possibly, um, if they're going to stick with the with the gravel, which I believe they are, um, that maybe a monitoring well be uh, installed somewhere in an appropriate location, maybe at the at the uh, lowest point in the wall or in the middle of the wall or just out in, on the downhill side of the wall so that they can take a sample and uh, submit the, get it tested for typical uh, contaminants that come off of vehicles in a parking lot. Um, and they can provide that on a regular basis yearly to the um, planning board, probably the board of health and the conservation so that we could uh, see that there's no issues going on with that. That's that's just something that um, I know it was discussed. I don't know if they had any other thoughts on that if they were, or if the planning board had any other thoughts on, on that in terms of paving versus not paving. Um, that was just something that I um, spoke with Martha about. So I don't know if there was any uh, determination on that or if the commission has any concerns relative to that, so. Can I comment on that? Uh, absolutely. So we, we do propose to do a uh, use a recycled asphalt product wrap, uh, which which would be spread and graded and compacted with a with a heavy roller. And it is <laughs> basically impermeable um, after it's been rolled in place. And we propose to use that because it's a lot less costly to do repairs when tracks, um, you know, chew it up or whatnot. And it, the, the water will still flow to the catch basins and to the uh, oil water separator tank, which we've put into the plan, the drainage plans as well. Okay. So that using the wrap, the curve number was, is, um, Joe reviewed that with, with the curve number that you're gonna be uh, using for the runoff calculations. That's in the calculations now. 
That's been there all along. We've been using okay. 96 yeah. for gravel. Okay. Yep. Yeah. yeah, that sounds reasonable. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So I guess that kind of addresses that, I believe, unless there's other issues with the commission. So just so right. the um, yeah, just to con, con, uh, get back, uh, so the commission should be aware that the uh, planning will be uh, also looking for a tree mitigation since it was significant clearing of the site prior to and will be necessary as part of our site plan uh, component. So there'll be a component of that in this. So uh, Bill, just so I'm, I'm clear, you're confident that the uh, catchment, oil catchment system as it's designed would address any uh, uh, spillage? Yeah, yeah, that would, any any major spills, theoretically they should be reporting it to DEP. Mm -hmm. But yeah, it would be, it'd be caught into the catch basins and the, in the uh, oil and water separated prior to, and then it could be, as long as those are maintained regularly, yeah. um, there shouldn't be any issues. Are those mostly in the building or are those for the parking area as well? That's for the parking area. There's actually the catch basins, which have the deep sumps and the oil hoods, and then the, the actual oil water separated, which, in line with all those before it goes into the uh, stormwater basin. Perfect. Thank you for clarification. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Peter. Um, for my part, uh, yeah, I just want to second Ben and I think Mary too. You know, this was, um, you know, I appreciate you uh, putting this together. Um, I think the only thing that I haven't heard. Um, that may well be already addressed and just forgotten about it is whether or not there's some kind of uh, invasive management, you know, plan built into this, um, you know, to keep track of, uh, you know, the, the constructed areas, um, you know, the area behind the wall, you know, the sort of the boundary between the, uh, um, the actual site and then the, the wetland and the, the semi-natural areas. Is that already built into things, or is that something that we've talked about a long time ago? I'm, I'm not remembering. Typically, we'd have we request that you know two years monitoring of any any restoration planting area that's on the other side of the wall. So that area would be maintained had have to be maintained free of invasives during that time, but other invasives that exist beyond that. I don't think the applicant is responsible for. Okay. Um, you know, the uh, Ben is just reminding me, you know, that there's now going to be sort of that big open space and behind the wall. And if that, you know, becomes a, an invasive problem, you know, if that's worth discussing, maybe a, per a perpetual condition, you know, where maybe there's an annual walk down in there, but, um, yeah, that just you know prompted my mind there. Um, but it yeah, might be, other than that, this this might be a project where we we would consider having a um, environmental monitor during construction because it's close enough to the yeah. to the wetland. Yeah, that would simplify that and sort of remove that whole issue because you wouldn't end up with a seed bank built into it. Um, but yeah, other than that, sort of you know get, you know get, maybe getting the cart ahead of the horse a little bit. Um, there's nothing else on my mind. Um, all right, so then let's turn uh, out to the public. Do you have anybody uh, here to uh, speak to or comment on this one? I do not see anyone. All right, going once, going twice. Okay. No public commentary. Um, right. So then where does that leave us with this one? Do we, it sounds like we've got most of our um, issues addressed. Uh, it sounds like there's a couple of items coming from uh, the planning end of things that we might want to um, wait and see if they influence the plans. Um, but uh, it sounds like we've run out of things to talk about in a, in Brian, a big way. We have, yeah, we have two new people that just came in. Interesting. Um, all right. Uh, are they all the way in? Or are they still loading? 
Loading. All right. When they when they finish loading, let's double check and make sure they're not here to comment on this. Um, Mary, I'm just trying to remember uh, any of those comments you made. Were any of those sort of action items for right now, or are those just sort of things that we'll talk about when we get to the uh, the orders? Um, it depends on whether or not you want to see a, a new planting plan, or, or if we are comfortable with a written description of a plan that we can condition. Uh, I, I think, yeah, I think uh, certainly in my case, uh, I've learned my lesson from uh, Plumbush about making sure we have all of our information, uh, you know, on plan sets. Um, right. We can we can condition something that says. We uh, we want to have this many plantings in this location. It doesn't. We don't have to condition that. I wouldn't make it a condition that we receive a planting plan. I would just make it a condition that this is what the planting plan is. It's going to consist of this many plants in this location. So it, it's up to the board if they're comfortable with that. I just think we could do it either way. Yeah, that's kind of six and one and half a dozen of the other to me. Mm -hmm. Um, all right, well, anybody uh, want to chime in on that one? I think I would prefer the latter of Mary's options where we condition a specific planting plan. If I okay. heard her correctly. Okay, so then that's fine. You know, um, uh, Bill can, you know, work with whoever he needs to work with on that one. Yeah. Oh, um, I can write it up and I can send it to uh, to you guys all just to take a look at. If you have any comments, we can change it before we finalize it. That's okay. Okay. Sure. That sounds good. That sounds uh, perfect. Um, all right. So then in a manner of speaking, it sounds like we've run out of things to talk about. So what do we, is our... Do we want to uh, have a, a monitor during construction? Question. Um, I find in projects like this, it's helpful to have somebody accountable to provide, um, you know, reports every couple of weeks during construction and that it be someone that is independent of the contractor. Uh, yeah, what kind of, um, you just said a couple of weeks, you'd probably want to put a, a like date certain and after everything over, you know, an inch of rain or something. I mean, what kind of standard do we want to No, that that um, environmental monitor be that's, you know, approved by the conservation administrator, you know, that's qualified in um, well in management and that visits the site at least once a week during periods of active construction. OK. Um, make, to make sure that the order of conditions is being complied with, that the erosion control barrier is in place and being maintained, that the basically we need construction a is being phased. It's yeah, it's so that Bill hasn't doesn't have to go out there every day. So we, yeah, we basically need like a, a SWIP monitor for because they're going to have to do a, a EPA SWIP monitor. Yes, yeah. yeah, SWIP, which we probably want a copy of prior to construction. Can they trigger it because it doesn't. I don't know if they're. I think they are over an acre. Yeah, if they're over. They an are acre. No, over an acre. Okay. I believe so. Is it two point four acre site and they're using? <laughs> yeah, it looks like it. Seventy percent. <laughs> yep. Quite a bit. A disturbance anyway so okay um yeah sorry i'm starting to dull a little bit um excuse me typically isn't the owner um in charge of the swip monitoring it can be and can be. W w wouldn't joe um swartka be uh, monitoring the site as well during construction I, we don't know what the planning board requirements are for that. Probably will be planning board. Typically on other projects I've done in town, he, he monitors as well for planning board. Yep. If that's the case, then you can use that person. Yeah. That could be your environmental monitor as well okay. for, to, to meet that condition. Yep. Would make sense, you know, since he's yep. coming anyways. Right might save me a little bit of cost. Yeah, just to do double duty there, yep. yep. All right, so Bill, you got 
uh, let's put that on uh, Bill Holt. You want to sort of sort that out and get the language right there? Yep. Um, okay. And what else? Um, so are we going to hold this open or are we going to move something along? Where are we with the, um, the process and procedures and plans and whatnot that we have to worry about? I, I Do we think make, a motion? make a motion? Yeah. Yeah. I think we're, we're, you know, surprisingly, if you, yeah. We can probably. All right. Well then, you know, the make, floor is open. Can we make a motion to approve this project with the conditions that we've mentioned? I think is that so. your motion, Bill? Yeah. I will, I will second that. All right. Well then, roll call. Uh, Benjamin. Yes. Uh, Bill. Lord. Yes. Uh, Daniel. Yes. All right, Mary. Yes. Peter. Yes. All right, and I'm also going to vote in the affirmative. It looks like we've actually figured this one out. Well done. Hard work. Chris, you got a pat on the back for this one. Thank. It's been a long ride. All right. All right. Well, then, um, yeah, uh, Bill Holt, obviously, you know, uh, you'll keep in touch with them about the paperwork and um, getting that language tightened up. And, uh, and Chris and Kevin, you obviously don't need the, uh, the script about appeals and timelines and things of, uh, of that sort. Um, but yeah, all right. We, uh, we're done with this one. Weird. <laughs> um, <laughs> it's going to be hard not to see you guys again next meeting. We're sorry to go. Mm -hmm. <laughs> All right. Well, then, uh, thank you, and we will uh, look forward to seeing how things work out. All right. Hey, thank you. Glad thank to move you. on to the next step. All right. Next on the agenda, we have Doug and Shay DeAngelis at 110 Hay Street, DP number uh, still to be determined, a continued NLI to construct a seasonal gangway and floating uh, dock from their property, continued from March the 9th. All right. Brian, just to, just to yeah. remind you, Brian, I need to abstain from this hearing. Thank you, Mary. Former, former client, client. Thank you. All right. So I see uh, Mr. Daniels' face is on mute. I'm here as well. Uh, David Smith from GZA. Oh, there you are. Yep. So I'm here. Right. With, um, yep, uh, here uh, presenting the project there for the seasonal gangway and float at 110 Hay Street. I am with uh, Doug DeAngelis, who is the applicant on this project. Uh, we were before the commission back on, I guess it was March 9th, and presented the project and um, for the, um, the three by 40 foot. Um, seasonal gangway out to a 10 by 14 uh, bottom anchor dock. And um, there were, uh, there was a, a, a comment letter that was um, sent in, I think earlier that day of the hearing uh, from Division Marine Fisheries that had four comments on it. And um, after presenting the project, I, I believe the commission members uh, had had concerns um, that pretty much related to those four different uh, comments or, you know, one of the four anyways. Um, and then there was a question about um, procedure <laughs> on um, installation and removal. Um, we have uh, made some revisions to the drawings based on those comments and we provided the commission 
um, with a supplemental uh, package, I guess, uh, on March 25th um, that addressed, um, I believe, most of those comments. Um, I can go each through each one, but I, I guess uh, just in summary, um, there was a concern about the height to width ratio of the gangway where it um, crossed over the salt marsh. And prior, um, the, the original uh, drawing submitted uh, with that application had it where we were about 10 inches off the salt marsh. Um, and, uh, and then obviously that varied, that increased with the height of the tide. Uh, so we've since uh, revised the drawing. We've narrowed the gangway down from a three foot to a 30 inch gangway. And we've raised the height of the concrete abutment by a foot. And we also added two steps that are integrated into the float. And what this does is that this, this allows that gangway at the lowest point to be um, roughly about 30 inches um, above the salt marsh. Uh, so it, it works out to be a one to one height to width ratio. Then obviously as the tide increases that that does increase. So the way the gangway intersects with the marsh, it's at an angle. So it really is only limited to that small little area where it's the close, uh, the, you know, the close proximity to the marsh. There was also another comment about uh, having the float uh, be 30 inches up off the bottom of the mud line. Uh, our original uh, design had it 18 inches, so we've since increased that. We've increased the, the separation distance of the float. Um, and that I think were, was really the two, two basic um, comments from Division Marine Fisheries that the commission members uh, kind of touched upon. Um, and then, I guess we um, also provided a document, a memo that uh, gave a procedure of, of how um, an anticipated procedure, how this would re be removed. Um, the idea is that, you know, we get some pretty big tides, um, you know, in the spring and fall. And during those, those high tide events, the float would be uh, essentially disconnected from the uh, from the moorings and be uh, shifted uh, towards the towards the shoreline. The, the post would be removed or raised at that point. And then what that does is that allows the gangway uh, to be able to be disconnected from the abutment. And with the movement of the float in the gangway, allows it to be able to come up onto the abutment. And with a roller and some wheel mechanisms and and some landside support, either with a winch or a small yard tractor or whatever, um, that, that can be uh, kind of taken up over the abutment and brought up onto the yard that's up above the steps. Uh, the float at that point um, would be moved. Um, there's an area that I guess I could show you on a plan um, that's over to the southern, southeastern portion of the yard or the property. Um, where the salt marsh is very minimal as far as the, the width of the salt marsh along the shoreline. And that float can be brought over to that location. Um, and it's my understanding that area floods uh, and that float can be brought over into that sort of uh, level flat area or landward of the marsh. And that um, gangway can either be disassembled that, I'm sorry, the float can be either disassembled and carried up the the bank into the yard, or it can be just uh, anchored on that upland upland area. Uh, the reverse of all that would be um, done in, in the springtime to to be able to um, launch those uh, or you know reinstall those uh, float in the gangway. I think if I think that pretty much summarizes the changes um, with this, and I think we've addressed most, if uh, not all of the concerns that were brought about at the last hearing. So I guess I'll take any questions. Okay, great. Uh, thank you. Uh, let's start, Bill Holt, let's start with you. Yeah, I, um, I did take a look at the plans and he has uh, increased the separation from the gangway to the, to the uh, salt marsh. Uh, to one to one up to one seven 
one point seven to one um, during high tide and low tide, uh, which meets the DEP standards and the Army Corps standards. Um, I would say that we need to condition that he has a he has to have a master permit, a ten A permit uh, to be obtained. Uh, I think it's yearly. Uh, the temporary uh, the storage area I, I looked at, and I'm curious how it's actually going to work. But um, I'd like to hear the opinion of the commission. I'm I'm just seems like a lot of a lot of potential to even affect the hot marsh in that area, and where they're going to be moving it. Um, but that's just uh, uh, my my thoughts anyway. Um, other than that, you know, the, the plan is an improvement over the previous uh, previous version, and they address a lot of the concerns. But uh, the removal is still a little bit of a concern of mine. Um, other than that, I think I'll hand it back to the commission for any, any thoughts on uh, that they have. Okay, thank you, Bill. Uh, Benjamin, let's go to you. Um, yeah, I agree with Bill that it's an, they answered a lot of the questions and it's an improvement. Um, I mean, I think philosophically, it's an interesting thing where um, the plan is trying to get around the policy and not follow the policy, but is kind of ignoring the spirit of the policy. Um, but I would say that my most specific concern is that the right now is the float removal plan where they're floating it over the ACEC at a, on a, a royal tide, I suppose, um, which is something we've already in the last ones that we before we adopted the policy we were we were not allowing uh, over on. You know, so as we already kept kind of set a precedent of not allowing the uh, you know floating of any of the floats or gangways over the marsh on high tides. So that that's one problem I have with it at the moment. I, I also have a lot of doubts about, or I'm skeptical of the ability to remove the gangway without doing damage. But um, certainly the float, the plan to remove the float right now is not really something I think that we have been accepting of most recently. Okay, uh, thank you, Ben. Uh, Bill Lord. Yeah, the, the float removal. I don't think that's thought out. If that's on 30 inch legs, rarely is there 30 inches of deep water over a marshland and to drag it across the marshland. If they're going to, if those legs are going to dig into the marsh, you're going to leave tracks in the marsh. Um, I think a better solution might be to float it down to down by Thurlow's Bridge and pull it out and store it someplace else and have it taken out by a tow truck or a crane or something. But storing them on the marsh is not something that we've been allowing in the past. That's all I got. Oh, oh Lord, you're just giving me an image of a of DPW, you know, with a crane attached to one of their bridges. Um, to, I'm not sure that the DPW would go in for that, but yeah, you, you never know. Um, I, then you'd have to tow them all the way to the landing, which is what we've required before. Um, you know, they can be pulled out at the landing, just like you're pulling a big boat. Um, I, I belong to the OCC Country uh, Yacht Club, Country Club. And we can't store our docks on the marsh anymore. And they probably did for 70, 80 years. And they have to have them pulled by the marina now at a pretty good expense. So I think that's an issue we need to either stop requiring or continue to require, but not be wishy-washy on it. Nice one. Thanks, Bill. Um, Daniel, what do you think? Um you know, didn't really see the presentation. My computer froze up, so uh, I'm going to defer. Okay. Uh, Peter? David, how much does this dock weigh? 
<laughs> the we're gonna try to make it pretty lightweight uh, out of aluminum. Um, the dot the float the float itself will probably be segmented so you can take it apart in small sections and be able to manually lift it out. Yeah. Um, I, I do want to just comment while I'm while oh, I hold, have, hold, hold on hold oh, on okay sorry so it's a thirty foot long dock how much does it weigh? The float is ten by fourteen. Um, maybe I'm, I'm, I'm the, the the gangway is thirty inch by forty feet. Forty feet. Yep. So, how much does the gangway? That'll be about four, anywhere between four and six hundred pounds, about okay. four fifty to five fifty, roughly. And, and then it's going up a hill, right? That's correct. No. Yeah. A hill over a marsh area. It's an upland area. Upland area. Yeah. <laughs> I, I think you're seeing the, con the concern that everybody has with that. Well, the idea is to not impact the marsh. That's why we we're going to schedule this and do this at a high tide. So there will be very minimal of no impact, uh, be able to lift the gangway up off the float and be able to not impact the marsh at all and just um, have it go up the slope. I just don't see how you're going to, even once you disconnect, the end of the gangway from the float and you have it on a roller and a winch how you're going to keep the foot of that gangway from hitting the marsh as you there might have to up. be some manual labor involved to help keep it up until they get to a pivot point where it can be just rolled right up the slope like me like yeah i guess what does that mean it's not going to be a one-person operation It'll probably take several people to, to logistically bring it up the slope. And I, are you bringing it up from five to 19? Is that right? Or five to, is that right? Five to 19? Uh, you mean an elevation? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, Let me just refer back to the plan here. So the abutment um, is going to be located at elevation 13, and it's going to be going up the slope from that point. So the abutment is at 13. The dock is going to be at So what these, I, let me see if I can clarify. So the, the float that you see right where the cursor is, that has legs. Those legs will be removed or raised up. It only draws about four inches of water as far as the draft. That'll be brought up to the edge of the banking at high tide. At the same time, that gangway is being disconnected from the top abutment with a roller attached to the top of the abutment that can winch that um, up until it hits a pivot point that gets disconnected from the float and it gets brought up the slope. <laughs> yeah, I, I think the one thing is that it, it's six, gonna be 16 is your friend of your invert, not 13. Um, because if you're just eyeballing that grade, that's what you have to get it over, not 13. You need to get it up over 16. Um, so, but yeah, I think, I think that's right. Actually, personally, I think that the roller happens at the, at the top of the steps, um, because at a, at a super high tide, you're going to be able to get the, the float close enough so that you can get that end of the dock up to the 16 foot elevation. Yeah, getting it at 13 is not going to do anything. I think what he's saying is this this will slide. Looks like we slide that to here. That would slide this up to here. That's correct. One step at a time. 
Well, it might have to be a couple of guys that are in, you know, below the abutment trying to lift that up, you know, at the same time that there's the rollers being um, utilized with, uh, you know, either a tractor or a winch on the top side. that shows the float being pushed landward. You can kind of see where the, uh, correct, yep. And then the gangway would be going right up that slope. It wouldn't go far, as far as the salt marsh. And then when the float, when, once the gangway is lifted up on the upland, the float's gonna go over the marsh. It's not gonna sit on the marsh. That area where it's identified as winter storage that gets flooded at high tide. So that float will be brought over onto that upland area away from the marsh. And the idea was, you know, that could be constructed in segments so it can be taken apart and actually brought up the stone steps um, that are to the north leading up to the house from that point. So there's gonna be enough water to get it to here. Minus the legs, the legs have to come off. The legs will come off. The legs are adjustable. You know, they're, they're set at the 30 inch, but you can, it's like in a sleeve where it'd be constructed within the float so that they can be lifted up or totally taken off. So you just rest, you know, just the pontoons are sitting on the water. Certainly an option could be to, you know, remove it um, by water uh, as Bill had mentioned um you know elsewhere but uh, i think the applicant was trying to do everything um, within the property recently we've been requiring um that they not be taken over the marsh and you know that as bill was saying bill the lord is saying that they'd be taken off by wire water to an appropriate place to remove them rather than over the marsh. Um, just to be clear, is that because of concerns about actually touching the marsh or some other concern? Yeah, damaging the marsh, putting it over, um, bringing it over the marsh, and then um, basically also long term concerns about people then storing it on the marsh a after a given period of time. Okay. Well. So this just removes any worry about compliance or any and worry about damaging the resource area. Um, separately, uh, it may be good to, I, I, did you call David for mooring chains between the mooring and the dock? The moorings in the dock, were those chains or were those a different material? Or did you not specify anything about the, for the float? Um, the float, I believe, is going to be anchored with chains and, and mushroom anchors. It may be good to use something other than chains so that it's not, in, as the DMF letter said, you're in a shellfish area. And so when you're at low tide or you do things, the chains are going to sweep the mud and impact the area. So maybe better to use something that might have less impact. Um, we could consider elastic roads. That's an option, very expensive. Um, and given the fact that this bottoms out, um, I, I guess it could work. You know, it could minimize the uh, chain impact. I don't think you're going to see a whole lot of movement out of that chain. The float's only going to be floating during the upper high tide periods, from about mid tide to high tide. I mean, cable could probably also be a, a an option there as well. Yeah, probably lighter, the better. Yeah. We don't anticipate a whole lot of load, you know, certainly not wave action or, 
you know, strong currents. You heard a little bit of an eddy there. Um, I don't know what would happen in flood, in a flood situation, but there's certainly a lot. Out, you're right next to a high current zone, like a very frequent high current zone. So I don't know. But, yeah, it is actually. It's I mean, there is a lot of current in there, but um, not where the dock is actually, or not where the float is, um, which is one of the reasons we moved it from. You know, way back when we were originally thinking about putting it over and by where the storage area is proposed. Um, uh, this is a much lower uh, water movement area. <laughs> so um, just out of curiosity from somebody that is not in the business of uh, shopping for docks all that frequently, I mean, are there uh, other options technologically for what we're trying to do here? I mean, we're not trying to launch motorboats or um, have, you know, raging uh, parties with, you know, three, 30 people on the dock here. Right? This is, you know, meant as a kayak launch. Um, is there something lighter, you know, like, I mean, for instance, they do inflatable stand-up paddle boards. Is there an inflatable uh option that you know would be easier to deploy and take in that would accomplish the goal uh is there something lighter uh both in weight and footprint that we could talk about that maybe would uh be worth bringing up i mean i, I literally don't know but um would something a little scaled down be worth talking about I think we have quite a bit of constraints here. So we are just trying to, you know, be able to span the marsh with the gangway. You have to support the gangway, um, you know, with a float that's going to be able to, you know, support it. Um, you have to design it with legs to be able to keep up off the, um, the tidal flat. The idea is to keep it as light as possible. Uh, the size was, you know, they, the, the, applicants want to be able to use their kayaks. So you get it too small, you're not going to be able to maneuver a kayak and store it on there, or at least get it up off of the, uh, out of the water and be able to use, use it. Doug, Doug can chime in on, um, you know, the, the particular use, but um, we did look at various options. Unfortunately, there wasn't a whole lot uh, given what we we're trying to, you know, the constraints and, tr and trying to be able to get this permitted. Yeah, we do have some experience on the, we came from the Ipswich River um, and the dock we had there, which we only use for kayaks. Um, uh, you know, the main difference here, it had the same sleeves that, that allowed it to, to stay up off the bottom and uh, to, so the, the um, stilts to stay up, up to keep the float off the bottom. And uh, the main difference here is that um, we added that lower freeboards so that we could get in and out of the boats easier from the one we had in Ipswich. Um, but I think that, you know, the, the one concern that I think Ben had, um, you know, I think we can come up with a way of getting it over the marsh without actually touching the marsh. Um, and, you know, part of the reason why we're doing this is so that we're not impacting the marsh by walking back and forth over the marsh. Uh, so, um, you know, I, I think that particularly if we build it in at least two sections, that um, coming up with some way of, um, you know, at a high tide, getting it up and out and onto that bit of land without touching the marsh, I don't think is going to be a problem. But. Is that little bit of land, is that something you own? It is, it's not, it's one of the reasons why, and I don't know whether um, David put it in the new packet, but um, we have a new letter from the trustees um, because the old one referred to the previous plan you looked at. Um, and uh, the previous plan you looked at, which was the one the trustees were originally given, um, incorrectly identified that bit of land as owned by the trustees. <laughs> um, and uh, so, you know, we went back, I went back to David at, at uh, at T2R and, and basically said, you know, look, we, we talked to Donna Home Parkers and, and you, you guys don't own that land, you own all the marsh. And he's like, yeah, yeah. So, so that's why we got the new letter from the trustees. Thank you. 
Yeah, it's on state GIS as being trustees there too. That's interesting. Yeah, we were we were um, confused about it as well when uh, when we first saw the property. <laughs> So you guys had it surveyed? And yeah, well, and in fact, um, it was surveyed um, and it's it shows properly on the survey plan and we actually even went and talked to um, Paul Donahoe about it to make sure, you know, and he said that that's, that's the way he understands it from all the title work. Cool, interesting. Brian, can I, uh, just a couple things I thought about. Um, it, if this goes forward, um, think about helix, small helix moorings for, uh, instead of uh, mushrooms, the ice won't pick them up in the winter, that sort of thing. Um, and also just to make clear, I've had a friend that had this sort of situation and you know when you have to move a float, it's like midnight or two in the morning. That's when the high tide is. So those that particular friend is no longer married. And I think it might have had something to do with that. Wait, uh, this is a, this is actually a situation we also had in Ipswich. So um, it became sort of a uh, <clears throat> shall we say a neighborhood party which involved ice cream that I make at home. So um, yeah it's understood it's not all it's it's a it's a it's a community effort <laughs> well while we're all sitting here chewing on this let's uh turn to the public do we have anybody uh here to speak to this one any public commentary I do not see no. Anything. Well, um, there's a Ryan Greenwich who just doesn't seem to be able to connect audio. No, let's see what happens with that. For now, don't worry about it. So, I let's have a discussion in this case about uh, Mr. D'Angelis's point um, that without a dock, you just walk through the marsh. How, you know, whether it's um, him or uh, friends he has over or, um, you know, the, the homeowner that comes after this. Um, you know, with in a minute of speaking, with going, even if this dock were to uh, cause every damage that we are um, worrying over, is that preferable to uh, a social trail going down to the water, you know, down the steep muddy slope? If anybody, you know, feels like slip sliding up and down that slope, you know, maybe this is more of a thought experiment than something realistic, but uh, maybe that will help us with this. Uh, ben, do you want to poke about 100,000 holes in that idea? No, Brian, I was having the same idea. I just didn't know how to broach it. Um, you know, the, I, I actually just opened up the um, site plan that was provided at the previous meeting because I, for some reason, I found it a little more i think some of the annotations were just a little bit clearer um yeah i, I just don't know i don't know about frequency of use but it, it, for me it's like there's existing stone steps that go to the bottom of the you know kind of more of that like non-marsh area down where the floats being proposed to be pulled out and you know you keep a kayak up by your screen porch up there and up on the bank and you want to take your kayak out you walk it down the stairs and go right to where the bank's a little bit cut you know right on a high tide ride the tide up the marsh come back down on the low tide and i don't know you know you can go dead you know if you just follow those landscape stairs at least on the plans and from what i've seen when i've driven by you just walk straight up across that area put your kayak in and 
jump in a kayak and go for a kayak without having the impact of, you know, six months a year of having the dock and the float and having to deal with everything else. So, I mean, it's not, it's a kayak, I guess. I do a lot of kayaking in the marsh and that's what I do. But if, you know, if you're doing something you're doing every day, I guess there could be an impact. Um, I just don't know where the trade-off is there between having, you know, temporary, you know, erosion control and all this other stuff during construction coming down into the ACEC and then having a structure and having all you know, this whole huge thing with the ramp and the floats and taking the float out and all that. So I'm, I, I was in the same mental space as you. Well, that's unfortunate. <laughs> <laughs> we, we shouldn't go back to the same space at the same time too often. Um, <laughs> uh, anybody else want to contribute a, a thought to that? So I think the thing that the commissioners are having a hard time with is the stock coming in and out. That seems to be the stumbling block here. And if there's a way to get around that, I think there's going to be a more pal palatable reaction because uh, that seems to be the obstacle here. So I, I would say if there's a discussion point or two that you can help help us with that, now's the great time for that to come up, um, either Dave or Doug, I don't know. Well, it's certainly, I mean, the, the, there's various options you could do. You could take it all down river, get underneath the bridge, you know, co coordinate that whole effort and, and do that option. Um, we're trying to make it easy for the owners to be able to do this, you know, after an ice cream party to, to have friends over and, and be able to do this on their own property. I mean, you can get a, a crane to come in, you know, twice a year in the backyard and lift everything up, you know, that way. It's just an expense and cause a lot of damage. So we we're trying to find a, a, a way, a balancing way to be able to do this in a, in a way where we wouldn't impact the marsh. Is can I just tell me understand? Is it uh, Peter? Is it is it? Um, are we more concerned about the gangway removal, or more concerned about the float removal, or or like where is the bigger concern? I think what I'm hearing from the commissioners is the whole process of taking the whole apparatus in and out, and because you, you you're relying on tidal stuff, and you know you know as you know it's going to happen at strange hours, and it might not happen in the best weather over the best conditions and you know something goes sideways because of something then you know there's another new issue it's been it's a potential safety issue so what how can you do this achieve what you want to achieve uh with i guess the, to make the commission as most comfortable uh in with good safety because you know dealing with something that's 400 pounds 600 pounds in the middle of the night during a storm i don't think that'd be too much fun if it happened that way, if it played out that way, I don't know. Stuff seems to happen that way though. Yeah, I'll, I'll back you up on that one, Peter. It just feels like, you know, there's half a dozen easily uh, guessed at uh, complications. You know, there's probably two or three dozen more that, you know, we can't even think of. You know, the way that these, you know, the way water behaves and moves things around. So, yeah, it just the the predictability of um, yeah, it just feels like there, there's too many assumptions built into uh, the the procedure that you know you guys have confidence and by all means you know that's what you're supposed to have, uh, but you know we just sort of see too many. Um, it's a thin it's a thinner path we think than you think. Um, and it just seems like there's opportunity for mistake and failure and oversight and undersight, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I guess, hold on just a second. Um, I guess I'm just trying to understand like where the, I, I don't really understand where the line is here, where where the, uh, for us as the applicant, I don't understand where the where the line of, of uh, 
comfort is. <laughs> I, you know what I mean? I just don't understand what what we're shooting at or what the target is. Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead, Bill. I've done this kind of stuff quite a bit through my lifetime, and it can be done if you make that ramp the right way with a smooth bottom and build in the roller system, you probably can float the heavy end inland and drag it up onto your property. And those docks look like they're freshwater docks is where they started from with the adjustable feet. If that's the kind of mud you can walk in, those feet will work. If that's the kind of mud that I have up at my end of the river, They'll sink right down, and that, that'll be so stuck in the mud when high tide comes, it won't float. But that's not the problem. I think our comfort level is that if this dock isn't pulled out, we have a conditions problem that we need to enforce. And then that's just another thing on our plate that we've approved something that we all have doubts whether or not it can be done. And if it's not done, say it's left in all winter, is that does that become our the commission's responsibility to enforce or to revisit this issue and then deal with it? Uh, I think that's our comfort level. If we knew it was a simple thing that you could just pull them out and we wouldn't have to revisit this in a year or two. Um, we currently have docks that we have approved that are not coming out of the water like we asked them to. And at some point we need to address those issues. And if this becomes another one of those issues, that's our comfort level that we're not, I don't think we're feeling right now that this looks like this could be another one of those problem areas for us to enforce down the road. The intent is to remove this seasonally and not leave it in year round. Well, it's, ice, not just, it's not just the intent. It's, it's, uh, I mean, I have a huge financial incentive not to do that because it's not going to, it's not going to make it. Right? I mean, <laughs> Yeah, it's, it's not just that. It's, it's I, I guess I think in one way, Bill, what Bill's trying to say too is that if we approve this, we want it to can be conditioned in a way that we know is going to minimize the chance of anything going wrong or not happening because we don't want to get into that situation with you. So we're really trying to think about this from a you know wish for the best hope, uh, hope for the best plan for the for the worst type you know, aspect so that we don't get into any things because we do see a lot of these cases coming back to us, not just these, but any type of thing that comes before the commission. We're trying to do it in a way that is just going to minimize future problems. No, no, nobody wants to approve something that's going to be problematic for us and problematic for an applicant. Um, so I think that's everything we're trying to think about. And I think Bill's got a great point about the feet in the mud that I hadn't really thought about, but everywhere I've been in the, in the Parker and his tributaries, it's a little bit different than further down in Plum Island Sound where there's a lot more sand and firmer substrate than Parker's just a mud pit. Um, so anyways, um, yeah, I, I think for this to be a feasible project, I would like to see everything come out via water. I, I think I said that in the last meeting as well, but I, th I think that's the most tractable way to get this to work if you can get it under the bridges and everything like that. That's its own set of um, issues, but I don't, I think it'd be very difficult to pull off the gangway and not scrape up the marsh possible, like Bill said, but not, you know, I think, you know, how, how you know, I don't know what the ratio out, out of a number of years where it's going to be done right is, but I don't think it's going to be done right every year by anybody. And then, you know, I don't, I'd rather not see that float come out over the top of the marsh because that's not, you know, we're trying to get it keep away from that. As Bill was saying, we need to be consistent, not wishy-washy. And we've been consistent the last few times about not bringing things up over the marsh when we permit them. So I think that those are kind of the two bars I'm looking at right now. Hopefully that helps clarify things. 
So if we can, uh, again, sort of getting back to the float in particular, because that's the one that uh, I, makes more sense to me, I guess, um, as far as your concerns about it. The, the, uh, if, we, if we can come up with a way that allows us to get the float onto that flat area without the float touching the marsh, by, for example, creating something then imagine imagine a, something that the that after the float is floating over top of the marsh at a high tide, we put something underneath the float that's got no, floats no, on no, one no, end. No, what I'm saying is what I'm saying is that we are not. I personally wouldn't vote for something where you float it over the marsh at high tide. We're not even if it does not touch the marsh. That's the part I'm trying to understand. That is not something that we can condition because we are not going to sit there and be like, today is the day within this no, two no, hour no, I period. No, I understand that. You, that. I'm that saying you, if we can come up with a plan for doing it where the where the float doesn't touch the marsh. Uh, no, I, I think what I'm trying to say is that I, I don't think that I, I know I'm not going to vote for something that consists of floating the float, putting the dock over the marsh because there's no way for us to enforce that or to make sure it's done right. So that's why we're, you know, I understand that you are coming to us with every good intention and would probably execute it well, but we can't, we have to be consistent and that's the what we're being consistent with because it helps reduce any potential harm to the resource area and it helps reduce any future issues with all applicants, not just you. Uh, hopefully that's clear and, and that, you know, you understand where we're coming from with that, or at least I'm coming from. Okay, thanks. You, I guess I just so with with respect to the the things that the commission has purview over, you are stating that you have purview over that. You have the you have the right to say that we can't float the float over the marsh if it doesn't touch the marsh. So you're, you're talking about something you're doing in the resource area that we have jurisdiction over. Um, my belief is that you would be having an adverse impact. Um, I can't say you're not going to have an adverse impact to that resource area over time. So that is why I have that opinion. So it's within the jurisdiction area. And it's my opinion that there would there's a high potential for an adverse impact through that action. So that's why I'm saying what I'm saying. Okay, thanks. I'm sure there are lawyers who will say I'm wrong. Uh, would it be useful perhaps to maybe have um, a conversation or uh, have somebody present or, or something down from the main who maybe has some expertise in these sorts of things? Uh, come to a meeting or write a letter and talk about the various feasibilities of a downstream float uh you know because that was something that came up as another uh thing that the commission seemed uh, uh uncertain of and maybe somebody from the marina could sort of uh inform us of the reality or unreality of such a uh, option being feasible Would that uh, be of use to anybody? I wonder if it might be helpful, uh, Doug, to have kind of an offline conversation with Bill, uh, Bill Holt, to see if there are any potential other ways of looking at this to maybe then come back to present uh, to the commission so that there might be a, a, a better way to to uh, try to accomplish what you accomplished and also uh, address the concerns that the commission has. Would that be helpful at this time, you think? Uh, sure. I mean, it sounds like, I don't know if Bill Lord is willing to be part of this conversation, but it sounds like Bill has no, as much no, experience as anyone in the room Bill, on this. Bill Holt. <laughs> It was Bill Oh, Holt. I know what you're saying, Bill Holt, but I was just saying that Bill Lord seemed to be 
pretty we're pretty well versed in this topic from the discussion we've had so far. I don't know if it's uh, if it makes sense to include him as well or if he's willing. Yeah. Yeah, and that's that's something we can you can uh, if you get in touch with Bill Holt, you can loop uh, Bill Lord in uh, on things, and we can see what Bill you know where he stands on various uh, contributions, if you will. Um, but it sounds as if we're at a stalemate for the evening. Uh, and so maybe the thing to do, as Peter was uh, implying, is maybe let's, uh, let's take this up at the next meeting again and see if we can come up with uh, any ideas in the meantime that maybe uh, can get everybody's um, points addressed. On uh, on all all fronts. We weren't. Um, we don't have a DEP file number, so we will need to continue till the next hearing. Uh, there was yeah. there was an issue with the fee payment, which we've since resolved. Unfortunately, it didn't get into their system um, before this hearing. I, even, I, even better. I, <laughs> better what? Can I, can I discuss uh, a, an option? I haven't run this by the applicant, but I was just thinking, knowing the constraints and the concerns, if the gangway could be placed on top of the float and the float and the gangway come over to the roadway, lift it up with a crane and put on a flatbed, could that be an option? That, that personally, I think is that the section. That's a whole other ball of wax you know, what you do with the roadways and. Yeah, I, but I think that from Brian, from the CONCOM perspective, it's there's not going to be an issue. If the DPW and the and the town police are okay with that, then they are, but I don't, from a jurisdictional aspect, do we have any issue with it? I mean, there, there wouldn't be, yeah, I don't, I don't know. I don't know if there would be a jurisdictional issue to have there. It would be, be eliminating be the marsh. It would be floating. Yeah, it would be a novel solution. A thought. Um, all right. Well, I think we've all got some ideas to chew on at the very least. And uh, barring any other uh, contributions, uh, I think we should uh, have a motion to uh, continue this to the 20th. I'd like to make a motion to continue this to the 20th. Second. Okay, roll call. Uh, Benjamin? Yes. Bill? Yes. Daniel? Yes. Peter? Yes. And I will also vote yes. And so, uh, Mr. DeAngelis and Mr. Smith, uh, hopefully, um, hopefully, while you're waiting for DP to come up with a number, um, is uh, you know a solution uh, is found or presents itself that can you know address all the points that were uh, made earlier. Thank you. All right. Thanks, guys. Thanks. All right, moving on, what do we have here? We have Justin Leonard, 37 Boulevard on Plum Island, DEP number. We still don't have a DEP number. Um, how's that possible? Okay. A continued NOI to a small parking area, continued from March 9th. And uh, Bill, are you going to tell me this one's continued again? Um, yeah, but I'm going to give you an update. We do have a sketch, got it today. Um, obviously, didn't send it over to you yet because it was too short a notice. But we do have the, the uh, sketch that shows how he's going to restore that, that area. Um, and I know he's sending it into DEP, so we should have a number by the next meeting. So he asked that we continue to April 20th. All right, very good. Um, Who would like to make the motion? I'll make a motion to continue with this till the 20th. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you. Roll call, Benjamin. Yes. Bill. Yes. Daniel. Yes. And Peter. Yes. 
And I'm also going to vote yes. Okay, great. Let's see. Next on the agenda, we have the Governor's Academy at 1 Elm Street, DEP number 050-1248. Minor modification of an existing order of conditions for buffer zone management to include a fungicide treatment for turf blanket use on the athletic field located within the buffer zone. See also the request for extension of OOC below. Maybe right. both. <laughs> yeah, let's do both so, all right. Wendy, I'm sorry. Where'd she go? <laughs> yeah, I'm here. Wendy, Wendy Reed. Yeah, yeah, I'm, yeah, I'm the environmental manager for the Governor's Academy. Um, so this is a, an amendment to an existing um, order of conditions for a buffer zone management plan. Some of you weren't on the commission when we first um, applied for this back in 2017, but basically the whole campus is in the buffer zone, right? So um, we identified the major wetland areas and uh, the maintenance practices that go on in those areas and then put um, best management practices into this management plan. So um, the area that we're talking about right now is the athletic fields that are on Route 1. I think there's a map that I submitted with the letter. Can you show that, Bill? I can. Hold on a second. Just gotta find it. So um, while he's looking for these turf blankets, <clears throat> excuse me, are, are laid over the field in the winter to protect the turf from the snow. And when you remove them in the spring, you get a couple weeks jump on the, um, the growing season. So that, that's the purpose of, of them. What happens though, is sometimes the, um, you get, uh, it's called snow mold. It grows underneath the turf blankets. And so that's the reason for this um, fungicidal treatment. Um, so typically in November, after the growing season, you would apply the, the fungicide um, and then wait for two weeks and then put the blankets over it. It's a one-time application. It's a very dilute solution. Um, right now, we're not planning to do anything within the buffer zone. It's been done on the football field, which is just on the bottom of this um, uh, aerial photo near the softball field. That's outside the buffer zone. That's where we're doing it currently. Also, the infield of the baseball field, which is on the upper right, right there. Um, both of those are outside the buffer zone, but um, at some point we may do it on the soccer field within the track area and that would be in the buffer zone. Um, potentially also the softball field on the lower part of the map, which is near um, a wetland area and also uh, the um, an open water area. So that's the request. Um, as I said, we're not planning on doing this currently in any buffer zone areas, but it is possible. So. Um, so we wanted to discuss that. So in red is just the revisions that would be um, added to our current buffer zone management plan. These are just best management practices to avoid any impacts to the resource areas. Okay, thank you, Wendy. Um, Bill, you wanna lead off? Still yeah, I don't have any real comments on it. I'm not really familiar with the the treatment, but uh, unfortunately, I couldn't get too much information on it ahead of time. So, um, I, don't, I don't really have any comments. So, I'll leave it up to the uh, commission to, to take a look at it and see if they have any concerns. Okay, um, let's go around then, Benjamin. Oh, I'm, I'm just Googling up primary literature, Brian or Katie. Um, so <laughs> I probably right, well then we'll come, we'll come back to you while you can you can Google on the on the side there. Thanks, um, Bill Lord. I have no comments on this. Okay, uh, Daniel. Nothing. Nothing to talk about for me. Okay, uh, Peter? Is Mary here? I am here, yes. Um, oh, you are, okay. You just clicked on your video, just magically appeared as you spoke. 
Um, anyway, go ahead, Mary. Oh, I, I don't have any comments. I don't know much about this process either. So, um, I mean, if, if I, don't, I don't know what impact a fun, fungicide has on the soil or soil mo microbes or anything like that. So I, I don't have much to add right now. Okay. Uh, and Peter? I, I don't have anything to add. Okay. Um, so, yeah, my comment sort of would be a deeper version of Mary's. You know, is this fungicide a broad spectrum, all fungus aside, or is this sort of species specific? You know, it sounds like there's one species of fungus that's no, or is that just the, what people call it? And who knows what kind of fungus it is? Yeah, there's a few different varieties, but they're all, they're termed snow molds as a group. They're species that grow under, you know, in a warm, moist environment. Um, so it's not, it's not a broad spectrum um, kind of pesticide. Okay. And then um, just in the spirit of Ben, you know, being on the internet, Googling this as we go. Do you happen to uh, know anything about, uh, you know, the half-life or the, the surfactants or the active ingredients or any of the, the, the chemistry that goes into the soup, uh, you know, would make up the fungicide? Yeah, the, um, the carrier is a TH, THFA, tetrahydrofurfural um, alcohol, and it's, um, it's considered an inert um, carrier for organic um, uh, pesticide application. So um, from from what the, um, you know, we used a professional uh, pesticide applicator to do this process and they said that the um, within one day it's it's gone, it gets absorbed and um, so it's not a long half-life type product. Okay. Um, and then uh, what would be the um, ramifications of sort of not approving the the change would it be like the blanket um is that an actual blanket like you put a blanket on the grass like, yeah would the huge. blanket not be yeah they're they're like Go ahead. No. yeah they're like tarps but they're you know 40 feet by 100 feet there i mean they're, it's uh, quite a process so either we could put the tarps down without the fungicide in which case um we could get turf die off um, where the mold does grow, um, or we would not use the blankets and, um, you know, potentially the, the turf would not grow back as quickly in the spring. So okay. it, it, uh, if I could jump in. Go ahead, Mary. Yeah. I'm sorry. If I could just jump in. If, if we may need a little bit of time to just research this a little bit, and it sounds like this is not an application you need to do soon, um, you wouldn't be doing it till next fall, is that correct? Yes, yeah, so so we're also uh, requesting an extension of the, the current order of conditions. So that was why we wanted to include this amendment okay. mm -hmm. um, in, in case we would want to do it over the next three years. Okay. I don't have a problem with the extension, but it, I would kind of like to have a little more time to figure out just to be a little bit more knowledgeable before just saying yes. Um, it could be very benign. I just don't know anything about it. Mm -hmm. So what kind of information? I mean, I have the SDS. I mean, what kind of information would you want to see to uh, to evaluate it? I would just do some independent research on it. Okay. Yeah, this is very, there's already, I'm finding a few things on it, uh, the THFA. It doesn't have anything. Obviously, it's just the agent. But the okay. I, know, I mean, I know golf. some golf courses that, that uh, I work with that do a similar thing. I, I could um, contact them as well. Mm -hmm. But it's it's probably, you know, pr fairly benign. My guess is I just don't I I wouldn't want to vote on it without knowing for sure. So, sure. Okay. Well then, um, let's see. Anybody from the public here for this one before we move on to our other stuff? Any hands in the air? I see none. Going one. Going twice. All right, doesn't look like anybody's here for this one. Um, all right, so then let's break this up. It sounds like um, we've got the two issues on the table. Um, the so extension we continue this? and- 
first? Yeah, I think, I think um, this first one, uh, let's continue it so that everybody has a little bit of time to get up to speed on, on the details. And, and we can come back to this on the 20th. Uh, and I think that um, let's talk about the extension too real quick. Um, anybody, let's go around the horn. Ben, any thoughts on the extension? No problem with the extension of the currently approved plan. Okay. Well, the Lord. No problems. Okay. Daniel. Nothing. Mary. No, that's fine. Is it a one year extension or or three year? Uh three years we could give them. Three years. Okay. Yeah. Three. That's fine with me. And Peter. Yep. No, no issues. Okay. Um, all right, so then um, let's do a motion to pick up the request on the 20th and we can uh, give them the extension in the meantime. I make a motion to approve the extension. Second. Thank you. All right, roll call, Benjamin. Yes. Bill Lord. Yes. Daniel. Yes. Mary. Yes. And Peter. Yes. Okay, thank you. And then we'll do a continuance for the uh, request until the 20th, you know, first and second. Motion to continue the 20th. Second. Thank you. All right, roll call. Benjamin. Yep. Bill Lord. Yes. Daniel. Yes. Mary. Yes. And Peter. Yes. And I'll also vote on the affirmative. Um, all right, great. So, um, yeah, Ms. Reed, we'll figure that out and we'll get back to you. And, you know, hopefully it'll be a short conversation. Maybe we can put her towards the front of the agenda so she doesn't have to sit <laughs> off through all of this we next time. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right, great. Yeah. Thank you very much. All right, thank you. We'll see you then. Bye bye. Um, <laughs> oh, Mary. <laughs> All right, so uh, commission discussion. We have none on the agenda. Certificate of compliance. We have uh, number 24, uh, formerly number 22, Old Rally Road, DC number 050922. A request for a certificate of compliance for an order of conditions recorded on. Uh, 81007, book 27095, page 569, at the Southern Essex Registry of Deeds. All right, um, Bill Holt, what is this? It's, um, it's an old, obviously an old order of conditions that was outstanding, that was discovered in a title search. Um, I was able to obtain as built from the Board of Health and the order of conditions and the file um, design plans. So I went out and took an inspection of the site last Thursday and everything looks in order and completed according to the plans. So I would recommend that we issue in specific appliance um, for this particular project to close it out. All right. Uh, well, then I'm just going to open the floor. Anybody on the commission want to ask any questions? It, it was a septic repair. Is that what it was? It was, it was a septic repair. No, it was new construction, the house and okay. it was everything. Okay. All right. Uh, anybody here from the public for this one? Doesn't look like it. No one. Okay. All right. Well, then, anybody want to uh, move this one along? I'll move to grant certificate of compliance. Second it. All right. Roll call. Benjamin. Aye. Bill Lord. Yes. Daniel. Yes. Mary. Yes. And Peter. Yes. And then we'll also vote yes. Okay. That's all set. Thank you, Bill, for taking care of that. Um, Brian, permit. Brian, you'll we did an extension for the but do we want to, when do we want to circle back to 25 Northern? Oh, true. Oh, yeah. I'm just reading the list. You're right. Are they 25 Northern? You guys here? Yeah, I see. I'm here. Point. All right, go for it. You have the floor. 
I, uh, I've had, a, I had some back and forth with my clients, the uh, Galapos. And uh, as I understand this, what it comes down to is a change in the size of the second story addition, which essentially is a bedroom and a staircase. And uh, Mr. Gallopo has expressed to me his intent not to file for any kind of variance or special permit. So by way of managing that, he has proposed to reduce one of the dimensions of the bedroom by a foot. That gets him below the threshold. Uh, that presents me with a small problem because I have two referenced plans. One's the architectural plans. The other one is the Hancock plan showing the uh, site, both of which say that he exceeds the footprint requirement and would need a variance. What I'm proposing to you is that from the commission's point of view, the impervious surface, the existing footprint of the building, don't change. The, uh, the plans <laughs> are not correct, but the plans are in effect accurate from the point of view of your jurisdiction. Uh, <laughs> it's a fairly simple matter to revise these things, uh, but it's getting engineers to change plans is like hurting cats. Isn't that right? <laughs> and, uh, and my feeling in the matter is that while I, while I can't guarantee I'll have you the revised plans tomorrow, I will have you the revised plans before the 21 day issuance period expires. Would that be enough to satisfy you? Seems reasonable. I'm okay with it. If we if we specify the change that we want to see, so yeah, yeah. I think that would probably just I did, approve okay. the pl approve the plan, but ex but not the floor area ratio to say well, you know yeah. we accept the plan, but not the floor area ratio that's that's shown on the plan, and then they can correct that. Yeah, I did I did um, actually um, communicate with Peter Bennett, the building inspector, and he says that the covered covering the deck would not constitute. FAR as long as it's not enclosed and is not heated and all that. So as long as it's not conditioned, the way he put it. So you can't make it like a uh, living space. As long as it's not living space, they can put a roof over it. Exactly. This is a this is a deck with a roof over it to keep the sun off, basically. So, so it wouldn't count as FAR. So as long as they change the bedroom size, they would be under the 25%. And it wouldn't affect our plan because we only deal with the coverage, not necessarily the FAR in particular. I'm, I'm fine with this also. All right. Well, it sounds like there's a, there's a good uh, resolution on the table and everyone seems okay with it. So, uh, yeah, floor is open for a uh, motion. Maybe. Oh, wait a second. Yeah, in and out. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. It's not working nope. again, Dale. No, you star six. Did you star six? Or do we have to give him permission to unmute? I don't there know. Is. Okay. You're good now, Dale. I think I'm there. Okay, great. Um, one question is, so what? what is the allowable increase in square footage to the project to keep it within the FAR? It's a percentage, so it depends on what your floor to area ratio is. I, so I don't know what their exact square foot they could get away with was, but it's 25%. It's, it's on the plan. It's, it's the area times, the area times 20, 0.25 We're, will give you the square it, footage they're allowed. Yeah, just just in terms of looking at the at the assessor card right the the the, the lot is 3982 and they and uh so they would have 996 square feet available uh per the assessor card they have 756 square feet so give them 240 square feet to stay within the far so what i'm curious is with the addition they're proposing would that be within the 240 square feet I'm advised that reducing the bedroom dimension by one foot gets us to one or two feet below 
that critical threshold, which is 25% of the lot area. And, and, and how would that be assessed by the committee? I mean, how do we ensure that it is within within the FAR? Is, is tonight the only night, or is there another opportunity oh. to, to make that assessment? The, the actual, the, the FAR is not a concern of actually the commission. It's just any changes that would okay. result of it if they were to um, if they were to make changes to the plan to increase the FAI would be a ZBA issue, not a not a uh, conservation issue. If they make changes to the plan that increases the percent cover of the lot, that would be an issue with the conservation commission, which is not so based on. No, the plan I think like a, a good way to put it is that if we were meeting in person and what's happened in situations like this in the past is that there is some flexibility in person to make notated changes to a plan so if we we're meeting in person right now what would happen with that would be that mr gallipo and mr dick would basically hand right onto the plan you know subtract you know this is now not going to be 15 by 18 it's going to be 15 by 16 that that you know yields this new square footage which would bring it under these are the now the plan sets we're submitting to you and you can do that in person and they get entered into the case file on record because we're working digitally, we can't do that right now. So what we're trying to do as a commission is say, okay, you know, we're gonna accommodate you to some level because it's not even really our jurisdictional area. It's just a checkbox that says if if we approve something and it's and it is triggering the ZBA, they need to have at least applied for the ZBA. So what they're saying is that they're not they're gonna alter the plans, which they would in normal times just do it right in front of us and give us those plans. Mm -hmm um we're going to say okay you're going to submit us new plans that show this those are the approved plan sets that are going into the record and we're going to we're going to start writing everything up they're not going to get their permit until they give us the new plans that show that and that, it will have to be confirmed by the building inspector anyway because they also the that yes it. and does that make does that help you does that make Got sense it. yeah it does yeah i just don't understand the process and so there's another there's another checklist after this in terms of that they so someone else is looking at the plan. It's the building inspector. Yeah. Got it. Okay. Thank you. No problem. I appreciate it. Brian, your hand is up. Yeah. Are you on his phone now? Brian, why is your hand up? He got muted. <laughs> yeah, you got muted. He's, He's calling out. The phone. Oh, his phone cut out. All right. So, Brian, do you want me to take this over? Yes. Yes. Okay. So, I do not see any further comments from. Oh, yep. I do not see any further comments. From the public, in that case, I would look to get a motion from the commission. This is a negative determination, correct? This is an NOI. Notice of intent. Notice of intent. Okay. Barry, I think you had a, the elegant solution earlier, if you want to make the motion. Uh, I remember what, exactly what it was, but I moved to um, approve the project, uh, issue an order of conditions um, subject to um, receipt of a plan. We're going to receive a plan, an updated plan showing plans. the plans, showing the corrected floor area ratio prior to issuance of the order. Seconded. Let's do a roll call vote. Mr. Lord. Yes. Daniel. Yes. Mary. Yes. Peter. Yes. I will also vote in the affirmative. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Dick, for remaining online and helping us resolve this tonight. And we thank you very much as well. We're very excited. Nope, we, we are here. Good. Good luck. Thank I just don't have to get my video back on. No worries. If you, unless you have cats for us to look at, then please turn it back on. <laughs> thank you. No problem at all. Have a good evening. Have a great night. Thank you. Brian, do we have your audio back yet or no?
Yeah, I turned the computer. I just turned off and re and turned it on with the the computer. So my phone died after a four hour battery. <laughs> Bad old days. Well, you have the reins again. Let her rip. I think what we had the Governor's right? Academy done, so you're on emergency certificates. All right, emergency certificate. Uh, wait, um, no, nope. we have uh, extension permits for a town of Newberry North, near shore disposal site. Sorry. Sorry. Uh, so town of Newberry near shore disposal site, DEP number 050-1261, request for an extension of an OOC recorded on 42421 in 6697, page 462 of the Southern Essex Registry of Deeds. Um, all right, Bill, go. That date was actually incorrect. It should have said 42418 is when it was uh, when it was That's approved. Would it make more sense? Yep. Yeah. Would make a lot more sense. It'll expire in April 24th, 2021. Um, so the town is asking for an extension on that for three years. Um, we have the opportunity to receive sand from the Piscataqua River Dredging Project. Uh, yeah, that. <laughs> and we're hoping to receive that in this it's fall. Late. Be nice to them. <laughs> hoping to receive that this fall. Um, so we need to have this extended, and you're going to use the same disposal site they used before. It's, it's a near shore disposal site. It begins just south of the center groin and extends north to the end of the uh, beach that is the town had a right to. So, so that's where they're going to dis the, uh, deposit the sand. Um, we have this one and we have actually, for some reason, the town of Newberry presented one to, uh, had an OOC for the site in Salisbury as well, um, because we paid for the consultant to do these these uh, permits for both Salisbury and Newberry. So we just requested that one as well. And that was granted last week, I believe. So we're hoping to get this one extended so we can use this site for the depositing of the sand we're receiving. Thanks, Bill. Um, open the floor to the commission. Who wants to ask about this? Do they need to file anything more once they, if, if they, if we do accept more sand, do we have to amend anything? No, not, not, not for this permit. They are filing okay. for other permits with the Army Corps and, and a few other things that are in process right now. So. Okay, great. And funding. <laughs> Okay. Uh, any other thoughts from the commission? Doing once, doing twice, three times. All right. And then from the public, anybody here to talk about this? Doing once, doing twice. All right. All done with that. All right. So in that case, then the floor is open for a motion. Motion to approve this request for an extension. Second. All right, roll call, Benjamin. Yes. Bill. Yes. Daniel. Yes. Mary. Yes. <clears throat> yes. And I will also vote yes. Um, okay. We're, we're almost at the end. Uh, emergency certification, brief discussion on ability to issue emergency cer certificate for due nourishment for several properties, 25 Southern Boulevard, 10 to 12 Fordham Way, 4 to 6 Northern Boulevard, affected by December and February storm events. Owners would like to replace lost volume of sand and replace with American beach grass and snow fencing to restore lost dune, 3 to 1 maximum slope, 4 to 1 preferred dune face. Why is this an emergency certificate? Well, that's what I'm wondering. I, I was informed that that is the process they used in the past to uh, to allow this to happen sooner than later so they can get it done before the growing season for the doing grass so they can get it planted at the proper time and give it a chance to survive throughout the summer and hopefully take before the fall uh, so that it will hopefully um, help preserve the dune. So that's what I was told we could do. I didn't, wasn't familiar with it, the process. So I was also with the uh, Merrimack River Beach Alliance. Um, the same question came up in Salisbury and Newburyport, and they 
did indicate at that time that we could issue emergency certificates to the commission to do these nourishment and replanting of the of the uh, dunes that were obviously lost due to the storm events. So my question is, is it something the commission would entertain doing or should we just have them file notice of intent? Um, just I need to let know. I need to, I need to let these people know so they can either start the process or or start the process of nourishment or start the process of permitting. I just don't need I need to be able to tell them what to do. <laughs> there there are criteria for for emergency certificates and that they have to be to they have to demonstrate that there is an emergency and be it has to be documented some by some public agency or something that that it's an emergency. So it's not clear what the actual emergency is. And it also requires that the work be done within 30 days of the emergency. So, so yeah. If they're prepared to do the work within 30 days, then it, it might qualify. Um, if they can demonstrate that what the emergency is, it may there may be I don't maybe there's property that's threatened or a hazard, you know, to the community or something. I'm not sure what it you know. I was assuming yeah, because it's I think, eroding in front of these buildings. Right, right. It's in one of them, uh, four and six. They have sand up against the house right now. It's a good amount of sand up against the back of the house. Um, and they lost all of their dune grass, mm -hmm. which is mm -hmm. gone. <laughs> and yeah. all right, hey, Bill, let, let's shorten this one. Um, what Mary said. <laughs> well, no, so, I mean, I think this is probably a situation where in the past, and Dan, maybe you can help out here, where um, Doug is the one who declared this an emergency. Where, you know, awesome. like, as Mary was saying, it, it's got to get done within 30 days, and there has to be some public agent who says this is an emergency that needs to be addressed now. And I, if, if I, I can't remember this happening, I feel like I, there was a few times it happening. I'm hoping Dan might remember, but I'm pretty sure that and this is a case where Doug would have gone down there and said, there's sand against the house. This is going on and they need to replant the dune now so they can grow dune grass. And I think it's, you know, I'm saying as the conservation agent who is the one who's active out there that it's an emergency. Dan, does that sound right to you is the way you usually well, handle this? It, that certainly could have happened that way, but, um... You know, when I kind of looked at this question, and I looked at the three locations you mentioned, Bill, it just, they're all a little bit different. Yeah. I, mean, I do believe four to six was, had problems where they just, they had no vegetation whatsoever. If you look at the Google Maps, you know, uh, uh, Google Earth back in time, there's, there's nothing been growing there for 10 years. Actually, they replanted it, I believe, a couple of years ago. And, okay, so it's going it, again. It had been growing pretty well, and then just storm wiped it out completely. All right. I, it's funny, because this year, I don't even really think there was any major storm, but maybe, the, maybe there was down on the ocean front. Um, so for some of these, I would think you would have a, you would, allow an emergency certificate so the work could get started, but then maybe you would have a uh, notice of intent, which allowed further, further maintenance, like next year and the year after. Um, we, I don't think we really have any idea of what the, what are you trying to restore it to? I mean, there's no reference. Right. Um, and I didn't quite get the three to one versus four to one. I mean, three to one has kind of been the accepted slope that uh, sand will nat naturally take. Right, right. That four to one is a, is a gradual, more gradual slope, so that the, the wave action would would um, be dissipated better. It would, wouldn't cause if you get a three three to one slope, yeah. you get more erosion at the base of the total slope versus letting the waves ride up a little more. Right. So it's it's actually work on the coastal beach. And on the coastal dune, and a bank, if any. And it just, it, I don't know. It seems it would certainly require for the emergency certificate um, more specifics. And I, I yeah, can't the I can't volume of twenty-five the southern. There was. It's not even on the ocean front. I have the, maybe I have the wrong address. Maybe it's twenty-five, not southern. <laughs> 25, must be 25 Fordham, I think it is. Sorry. <laughs> okay, that might make more sense. Yeah. 
Um, but again, all those are different. The, I think the, the uh, problems are ongoing. This isn't, you, you might have an emergency certificate every year or something. It, it just sort of seems like it needs something a little bit more permanent. Okay, so what I should tell them to do is actually probably just file a notice of intent with what they plan on doing. If they want to plant now, then, you know, I would seem like we need more specifics. That's all. All right. All right. I mean, you, you'd need a topographic survey to, you know, with, with some kind of a volume estimate of material that That's you're going to bring told. in and want to maintain yearly like so we have a baseline for what yeah. needs to be maintained that's kind of what i told mm -hmm. them as i saw them um mm -hmm. and then they asked if there's any way you could do an emergency specific and i said let me ask because i'm not really sure mm -hmm. <laughs> i wanted to make sure okay if someone if someone's house is you know in danger of falling in or something that you know that that yeah, so obviously was, that's an emergency this was yeah so this was just a uh, movement of sand so mm -hmm. there we so I think there's only one item. Oh, the beaver issue. I didn't, it's not on here. Oh, hold I? on a second. We got one more other business and it looks like Tom Hughes is still here. Okay. Um, Tom, well done. You made it. Uh, other business, Tom Hughes for 105 High Road, informal discussion and general overview of the proposed OSRD providing open space with proposed bridge crossing to a trail network and wildlife viewing state. Good evening. I'm sorry, my cat's already gone to bed, so I won't be able to have a, my cat walk in front of me. Um, yeah, sorry. Um, can I share my screen? Uh, sure. Thanks. So um, you guys may have heard uh, that there's been a project in front of planning board for a while, um, 105 High Road. We've wanted to come into you guys, but we've we've um, it's been one of those things where we've been trying to get a path forward with an OSRD rather than going conventional. And we now feel that we're finally make, getting some traction at planning. And it looks like we are gonna be able to uh, come to terms, I think on an OSRD that moves forward on this property, which I'm pretty happy about. So this is 105, this is um, what the planning board was looking at. To give you an idea where the property is, it's, um, it's this property right here. Uh, it abut, abuts the, um, the, what is this, the historic antiquities property, whatever, the one that owns the- uh, That's a Pierce Little Farm? Um, yeah, and then the, then the airport behind it. Um, so, and it's really beautiful, beautiful wooded area back in here. This area up here is, um, is really a big agricultural field. Uh, so kind of zooming down a little bit. And then this is um, the concept for that frontal sort of uh, rectangle of the property. And it would be an OSRD. And then we have um, six parking spaces that would provide access for the open space. And then um, that's, that's just a yield plan as part of it. So then the idea would be we'd have a trail that would go over um, the real exciting area is this area back here. This will be a nice open meadow. It'll be really pretty. Um, but on this uh, rear part of the, of the open space, I'm gonna to try to zoom down a bit. Um, we have some wetlands up front and some wetlands out back. So the idea would be, and this is just purely uh, are, are kind of wide open for discussion with you guys. And what we wanted to do is involve you in how we go forward with uh, with this planning for this open space. Ultimately, we'll be coming in for, um, for a notice of intent for the open space only. The, the subdivision or, or the OSRD part of the development is all outside buffer. The only thing really uh, in buffer is really this trail coming in. And then the idea is to do a big loop, get us down into the back of the property, some, some sections of the, especially in the rear, beautiful open uh, wooded area. And then we would come back with the trail, kind of have a nice loop. Um, it's, it's, again, it's a real pretty piece back here. And uh, we did do a site walk. I did a site walk 
with the planning board. It must have been in 2019 at this point, and it's um, been going on. So I wanted to go over this with you and, and to give you an idea. I don't know if, if Steve Stoyer is uh, still awake. He's actually got like a drone video. We can give, give you a quick um, fly over the property. It's a short video. And then what I'd like to do is invite the commission on a site walk to come out, take a look at the property. Um, we're open to doing things like, you know, a viewing stand or, a, um, you know, sitting areas, or anything like that out in the open space along the trails. Um, and we're looking to have it be real low impact trail, just, you know, forest, basically forest off, clear the herbaceous vegetation and mark the trail well, and just have it be more like, you know, White Mountains Trail rather than, you know, no, no big stone dust path or anything like that. Um, that's kind of at least where we're starting. But again, this is, this is an outreach to you guys to involve you in this because this is gonna be what I envision a fairly fun NOI to come in with purely open space development for uh, for an area that'll be publicly accessible with parking who, so that- Who will own the open space? I believe the current uh, plan is an HOA uh, and it would have a conservation restriction. Who would hold so the restriction? Yeah, so ultimately um, we would come to you guys and have you be partners in the conservation restriction on it. So you would have and there'd be, you know, strict limits on what could be done out there. And, uh, you know, it does get you into some areas that in the future, if somebody wanted to, uh, you know, do future tie-ins to other open space, I mean, being right next to the, uh, to the farm there and, and um, all that, I think it's, it's a fantastic location. It's a beautiful salt marsh out here. Um, Hey Tom, do you want me to run that little zoom? The um, yeah. So here, hold on a second. Hold on. Let's not okay. get too far into this, just because it's yeah. ridiculously late. And at least personally, yeah. I'm going to absorb and retain nothing of this. Okay. Um, yeah. I appreciate yeah. what you're doing, Tom. You just your timing is unfortunate. No, um, I understand that, and I, and I I didn't wasn't looking to have a huge discussion with you guys tonight. I mean, if you've got feedback for us, great. But I think. Let's get a site walk scheduled. And um, if you guys want to kind of zone out and watch a quick movie, I don't think it's very long and, and it'll give you an idea of what the property is like. But I think ultimately getting out there, walking it is the way to really uh, get to know it. And um, and I think it's going to be it's going to be open space that I think is going to be destination, you know, open space that people are going to want to walk. It's re it's really pretty back there. and. Uh, you know, get you across the wetland with a couple of bridges. And, you know, this area is pretty nice. And, and then this area is just absolutely beautiful as you get back in here. Well, here, I, I think uh, if you've got the file ready, why don't you just send it, you know, and send it around on the email and we can watch it, you know, later mm -hmm. on, um, yeah. you know. Right. I, I yeah, it's like, it, yeah, we'll send you a link. It's several hundred megabytes. So we'll have to put it in like a Dropbox or something and you guys can download it and put theme music to it or whatever you want to do and, and watch it. But um, so with that, I guess what I'd like to do is, you know, set up a site visit, you know, as soon as you guys have time and you're scheduled to do that. Um, you know, we do want to, I think we're going to see, when are we back in at planning? Um, I think it's the second meeting in April. Yeah. Okay. So, it would be really nice to at least have gotten you guys out there and maybe come back on the 20th uh, to get sort of follow up feedback so we can then finalize plans to, to look towards coming in with an NOI uh, provided the planning board part stays on track. All right, uh, well then uh, in that case, I'm gonna just open the floor to the commission. Um, if anybody wants to chime in or pipe up or contribute. Floor is open. I just have two. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead, Mary. I just have two comments, and one is I, I think I'll have to abstain on this because I believe I flagged the site, and they, those may be my flags, Tom, still out there. Yeah. That, um, so, so you you did flag it. Let me just um, you flagged you it. You have reflagged it since then. I've reflagged using okay. your flags as a main starting point, but I did make some minor adjustments where I found mm -hmm. they were off. 
Um, yeah. Mainly there are a couple of flags I moved up and I omitted old. one. Right. Yeah. I omitted one flag where it was, it was too wet. There was no, nothing, nothing of any significance. Right. Uh, Neil, the other I, thing I, that I, feel I would like say is, yeah, because, yeah, we're, far, we're not near approving wetland boundaries at this point tonight. Right. Um, but the other thing is just whether or not the town should be holding a conservation restriction or some other entity, I guess we'd have to talk about at some point in the future. Right. Whether and, and that's really the Conservation right. Commission ha doesn't have much ability to monitor conservation restrictions, so. Okay. And we can, and, and that's all stuff we can talk about. Um, yeah. Again, this is one of those things that we've been waiting to a point where we kind of knew we would be able to do OSRD rather than having to come up with a more conventional approach to developing the land. And I'm pretty excited that, that we are actually going to be going down the road, it looks like, of having this whole back area being open space. Um, you know, we've got the ACEC is out back, but it's it's actually... I think it's shown at elevation 10, but it's really 9.2 because of the datum change from when the ACDC was mapped. But that's all within and past the wetland line. So it really doesn't make a difference on anything, but um, you know, all of that will be corrected before we come in with you guys. But yeah, I, I think a site visit would be, uh, it would be best now. And I don't see Mary, why you couldn't participate. I, I feel ownership of those flags. So, I mean, it, it's up to you when, um, if you feel there's any appearance, I feel like just disclosing that. Um, again, I've I've walked every wetland flag. I rehung every single one, and every single one when I rehung it, I double checked what was going on and adjusted as I as I saw fit. Well, and you guys, I mean, Mary, we would be doing this for the trail, not necessarily for the development. Yeah, so it's not. I know. Yeah, yeah, just throwing it out there. So maybe just you know either do a doodle poll or do you know send us some dates for potential site walks and we can all weigh in or something. Um, okay. Yeah, yeah let's, let's now because we're falling yeah. apart. Yeah. Right. Yeah, I, I don't understand why. <laughs> yeah. Oh, no. all right. Um, <laughs> no, well, well, thank you for hearing this. I mean, I have sent in this, this plan set, not with the aerials, but that's just out of my map. You guys can certainly look that stuff up. Again, this is just a beautiful piece of open space. And I really want to, I really look forward to like working with you guys to come up with you know just a real low impact passive conservation use um, that gets people out there that you know this is the kind of place that I think inspires more people to grow up and be environmentalists. So, cool. You know. Well, thanks for the invitation. All right, thank you. All right, Dan has his hand up. Sir. Well, it's just you know, are there any flags out there, Tom, where you? where your intended location for the boardwalks might be? No, but we can mark them. Um, the, all the wetland flags are up and we could certainly get out there yeah. and, and uh, you know, mark out. And the, the trail that's shown, I don't think that that is based, I mean, Steve, correct me if I'm wrong. I think you just kind of drew a loop, right? Were you following any any of the existing trail out there? No, no, it's, it's just plain, we, it's not, it's just shown to give an idea of what's going on. Yeah. Right. So, you know, if we walked out there and you guys thought, hey, this would be a great place to have the trail go through. I mean, we, we can make adjustments and have it, you know, really be be something that's going to be fantastic and not just based on something drawn on a plan. Yeah. Now, let's just, the site walk will answer a lot of questions. Thanks, Tom. Yeah, no, thank you. All right, so I'll stop sharing. Um, yeah, so Bill, um, we're basically going to be available for, you know, just about any time. So we'll we'll put together some dates. How are you guys doing during the day, or you, do you need it to be on a weekend? Earlier this evening, we scheduled uh, an evening walk during the week. Mm -hmm. uh, the next couple of weekends, uh, Ben is unavailable, and the light is up now. So you know, late uh, an evening dinner time thing is on the table, probably. Yeah, I mean, if the rest of the commission is much better on weekends and it works out, I'm more than satisfied to defer to the expertise that's out there. Okay, Ben, what's the earliest you can you can do? What what do you consider evening that you can get back for? Um, <laughs> my life right now is tide dependent, um, but you know, I, I probably five p.m. is about usually the earliest I can get back for. 
All right, why don't we shoot out some dates uh, at five o'clock at night? So I'll have to look out when Steve and I both don't have hearings and uh, we'll send that out and see if we can get something together through Bill. Yeah. All right, awesome. Thank you very much, guys. Get Great. some rest. Uh, all right, and what is left? Um, the, the thing that is left is uh, um, the punt that from this morning, from the very beginning about the bylaw. And um, all I'm gonna say about that is that hopefully you all saw the email that came in from Tracy today that we will be talking about our bylaw uh, at the spring town meeting, uh, about why we want it, why we need it, and why the town um, has an interest in it. And I didn't see that email, Brian. Am I again the only one? No, it's just it's, it. uh, um, the citizens. Uh, citizens petition <laughs> to require 60 votes for a no bylaw change. I saw that, but I didn't see that we were going to have any opportunity. I was going to ask whether we would have an opportunity to speak to the intent and kind of what Mary, you know, what I was to speak to the intent of the bylaw amendment that will not be heard this spring, but I guess at the fall, potentially. I think in a manner of speaking, I think um, we can figure out to do it and just like a general comment where, you know, one of us ends up and, you know, gets the microphone or something a little bit more formal than that. Um, yeah, and Mary was working on um, a bit of information, sort of the history, the background of the standing law and, you know, what we would hope to accomplish and what would be in it for uh, the townspeople uh, to do an update. And, you know, as far as I'm concerned, you know, this is just a good excuse to get some dates on the table so that we can have our public uh, input sessions um, ready to go at the springtime meeting so that we can stand up and let everybody know that, you know, once a month, for the next you know, couple of months, uh, every, every six weeks. You're breaking up. Oh, sorry. Um, Time to go to bed. Yeah, yeah. I am breaking up. Um, so. test, test. You're, you're pretty bad right now, man. Breaking up pretty bad. Yeah, I'm, I'm falling apart. Anyway. Yeah. Just, <laughs> Take a motion to... Yeah, that's, that's, that's all I had to talk about. Yeah, one Hold more on, wait. thing. Bill Holt has a thing. I'm sorry. I'm so thing. sorry. <laughs> Bill, you've got 60 seconds. The... I make a motion that we adjourn the meeting. I <laughs> guess. <laughs> We got a problem with beavers out at uh, mm -hmm. Middle Road and Adams Lane. Uh, Board of Health has issued a emergency trapping order to remove the be beavers and then in order for them to be able to open up the dam and let the water out, they need an emergency certification from us to allow them to do that. So I just want to know if we could issue that um, access is going to be from 108 Newburyport Turnpike. It's the TW excavating. Um, literally, they could park in the parking lot and walk about 35 feet to get to the uh, area where the dam is located. It's a. Uh, they I talked to DPW. They can break it up with this. Uh, it's basically pitchforks and, and shovels and a bar, and possibly a handsaw. That I, I would condition it no power tools and no power equipment to access and to um, have a controlled release of the water. In other words, they release it very slowly. And they've done it before, so they've, it's the same location, as Brian had mentioned earlier in an email, that it's a recurring problem. Um, maybe they should try to find a more permanent solution. I think um, Brian gave me a website that I uh, told James Surratt about, and hopefully he can investigate that and potentially have a better, pro better solution later on. Um, but this is an immediate problem that's uh, backing up into people's backyards and potentially affecting the septic systems and access. So the Board of Health issued an um, emergency certificate and I think we should do the same. I'm just wondering if, if I can issue that tomorrow or need to have the chairman issue it or if it can be done. Uh, I sent copies of it to everybody. You can, be do, you can do it, but we have to ratify it at some point afterwards. Um, okay. they, they should probably investigate putting in a deceiver it's an pro ongoing problem and there's a guy that we can recommend a couple that's guys what i sent to bill yeah. yeah yeah 
So receivers yeah. work like a charm. Yeah. Okay. All right. All right. Is it so? Should I, should I issue it tomorrow and let them do their thing, or? Yeah. Let me. Let's do a vote. Uh, let's do this formally. Um, somebody make a motion. Move to approve. Move to approve the emergency certificate. Seconded. All right. Roll call, Benjamin. No. Bill. Lord. Yes. Dan. Yes. I'm curious. Mary. I'm curious why Ben voted no. Yeah, me um, too. Um, um, I, I'm happy to vote for emergency certificate to pull the dam. I want for it. I think that we need to talk about aquatic connectivity of organisms before we go down a deceiver route. And I was unclear okay. about what the exact motion was. Okay. The motion is the emergency. That's all. Okay. But yeah. Okay. Um, <laughs> Mary. Yes. <laughs> She's rolled right through Ben. Um, Peter. Yes. <laughs> and also, yes. Um, yeah. Um, I thought you were going to have, you know, beaver sympathies. Um, anyway, yeah, we'll talk about the beaver deceiver thing, and that's fine. I just, whatever. Um, all right. Now, Bill, that's it. I think you had a motion on the table to get out of here. Second Bill's motion. Great. Roll call. Benjamin. Yep. Uh, Bill. Daniel. Good night. Yes. Mary, yes. Peter. Good night, everybody. Good night. That was epic. <laughs> Good night, everyone. Good night.